Okay, Leo, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting of the Civilian Oversight Commission to order. Um, I hope that um, all of you and your families are doing well. Um, as you know, this past Monday was Indigenous People's Day, and I want to acknowledge that we here in Los Angeles are um, on the traditional territory of the Tongva people, um, and uh, we celebrate them um, particularly because of um, Indigenous Peoples Day. It um, gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this month's mm -hmm. Chair of Civilian Oversight Commission. Our next meeting will be held on Thursday, November 19th. Um, instead of a meeting twice a month, I'd like the Commission's ad hoc committees to utilize the second Thursday of the month to hold ad hoc committee meetings. Um, as you know, we have been, our ad hoc committees have been incredibly busy. Um, for the month of November, the ad hoc meeting should be scheduled on Thursday, November 12th. Um, of course, the work of the ad hoc committees and the commission um, continues uh, even when we're not meeting. I want to note that since we last met, the shooter of the two sheriff's deputies in Compton has been arrested and charged, and um, both deputies are now out of the hospital. We continue to um, wish well for them and all victims of violence. Um, sort of a couple of preliminary matters. I want to um, note a change in our agenda for today. Item 2B, the issuance of a subpoena will not be heard. That issue has been resolved. Um, I also want to um, encourage everybody to vote, vote soon. Um, I um, voted um, by um, mail-in ballot, um, and uh, we have an impressive ballot tracking system here in California. Two days after I took my ballot to the post office, I got an email saying the LA County Registrar of Voters had received my ballot and it would be counted. So that is um, an email notification you can sign up for. I urge you to do that, um, particularly if you are not voting in person. Um, as you can all tell from the length of this agenda, it's very full. Um, and I um, wanna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard. So um, I'm gonna urge everybody to please keep their comments on point. Um, with that, I ask um, Ingrid Williams to please take the roll. Commissioner Bonner? Present. Commissioner Giggins? Present. Commissioner Harris? Present. Commissioner Kennedy? Here. Commissioner Ochin? Yeah. Kate Rubin? Yes, here. Commissioner Thompson? Commissioner Tolentino? Present. And Vice Chair Vera? Here. here. Thank you. Okay, um, great. And, and um, again, welcome everybody. Um, I'd uh, ask Commissioner uh, Kennedy to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes, I pledge of allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States, States of America, America. And, to the and to the Republic for which it stands, indivisible, and nation under God, indivisible, God. Uh, liberty and justice for all. Just for all. Justice, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, as you know from um, each and every one of our um, past virtual meetings, um, there are a few ground rules, um, as was indicated on the meeting agenda. Uh, if you want to provide live public comment, you must access the meeting through WebEx. Please use the web link to join the session with your first name, last name, and email with your computer or smartphone. 
When you register, you'll be able to select which agenda items you'd like to comment on. Your information will not be shared with other attendees. For those of you calling into the meeting, you must email us your comments at cocnotify at lacounty.gov. Please include the agenda item and meeting date in your correspondence. All correspondence received shall become part of the official record. Uh, when you're going to provide public comment, please make sure and eliminate as much background noise as possible. Depending on the number of participants, we will have either one or two minutes per person of public comment. I'd also like to add that while the commission wants to hear from you, we will not tolerate any disparaging comments um, regarding any of um, the, the, the two deputies who were shot and um, any other um, personalized disparaging comments. Um, as I say every time, please bear with us. We'll get better at this. Uh, there are bound to be some issues, technical issues, but we'll take that as it comes. Um, with that, let's get started. And um, when we talk about the um, uh, speakers, if a speaker wants his or her name to be placed in the minutes, they must indicate so. Um, agenda item number one, is there any discussion, um, at least initially from commissioners? Um, and then I'll go to see if there are any public comments regarding the um, uh, minutes from September 17th. So, first of all, are there any commissioner comments, um, concerns, issues regarding last month's minutes? All right, hearing none. Um, Jennifer, are there um, any members of the public who have uh, indicated they want to um, give a public comment on the minutes? There are no members of the public who have signed up to comment on this. Okay, is there a motion among the commissioners to approve the minutes from September 17th? So move this pass. And is there a second? Second pass. All right, thank you. Um, will you, uh, Jennifer, I um, mean, um, Ingrid, will you um, please um, take a vote, please? Sure. Chair Lael Rubin? Yes. Vice Chair Hernan Vera? Yes. Robert Bonner? Approve the minutes. Patricia Giggins? Approve. James P. Harris? Approve. Sean Kennedy? Yes. Priscilla Ochen? Yes. Xavier Thompson? Casimiro Tolentino? Yes. And that concludes the vote. Thank you. Then the motion carries. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn to agenda item number two, update, discussion, and possible action regarding the budget. Um, this has been a subject of great concern, not only to the sheriff, but other also to other members of um, other citizens in LA County. Um, over the last several months, the Sheriff's Department budget has been a pivotal point of discussion, and um, we are hoping to get some um, guidance or demystification or clarification um, from the um, CEO's office. Uh, this morning, we're joined by representatives uh, of both the CEO's office and the LA Sheriff's Department. We'll first hear from um, Ms. Sheila Williams from the CEO, um, followed by um, the Sheriff's Department Administrative Services Director. Um, I'm not sure who from the Sheriff's Department is going to um, speak on that issue, um, but we will learn that um, after the conclusion of, of Ms. Williams. Um, I, I know, Ms. Williams, before you get started, that um, you have received um, some issues and some questions that um, 
uh, that members of the commission had raised. And um, uh, I know that hopefully you'll be able to address those relating to the overall budget of the sheriff, um, the funding for the body worn cameras, um, MET funding, which of course we're all concerned about, um, and uh, whether the county is projecting um, cuts to departments across the board. And um, uh, one question that has come up in, in, in many instances has been, um, who determines from the sheriff's department um, is it the sheriff who determines where he will cut if he needs to, or is that something that is mandated um, from the CEO? Um, so that seems to be um, a big order this morning. Um, and if you have um, some thoughts or consideration as to um, what might be the effect of um, the passage of Measure J, um, if it does pass on November 3rd, um, that would be helpful as well. So um, with that, Ms. Williams, please go ahead. Thank you for having me. Um, I, yes, so Jennifer has brought up the PowerPoint presentation that I'll be walking through that will hopefully respond to the questions that the uh, commission has presented to our office. Um, Jennifer, you can go to the next slide. So as uh, the first question is pretty much about the Sheriff Department's budget and as of uh, supplemental changes. So the Chief Executive Office or the county has three budget phases. We have the recommended final changes and then what we call our supplemental budget phase. And so as of our last budget phase, supplemental changes, which was adopted by the board on September 29th, the department's overall budget is approximately 3.582 billion. It's split between what we call net county costs and um, IFT slash revenue. And so as you can see, it's approximately almost about one half. 1.9 billion comes from net county costs and 1.7 billion comes from IFT or interfund transfer slash revenue. Next slide. I don't know if you guys want, want to stop and ask questions as I present each slide. Why don't you give your whole presentation um, and then um, if if commissioners um, have questions, we can we can ask you that way. It's better to have the whole presentation. Thank you, though. OK. And so the um, budget is broken down into what we call appropriation categories, and those categories are listed below. We have with, um, salaries and employee benefits. That's the cost of funding all the staff employed by the sheriff department. We have what we call services and supplies. We have, um, that's where they purchase fuel, um, food, clothing, um, any office supplies, things of that nature. Other charges are usually where um, litigation charges hit. Um, that's also where leases and space charges hit. Um, for the department. And then, of course, we have capital assets or equipment. That's where they purchase large items um, for the department. And so, as you can see, the um, bulk of the department's um, budget is in the area of, of salary employee benefits. That's 3.1 billion. Um, the next category of services and supplies represents 11%. And then the um, other two categories are um, roughly 1%. Next slide. Um, the funding that comes into the department, as you can see, it comes in from a variety of sources. Um, primarily, they uh, receive funding from the state or Prop 172 that makes up the bulk of the funding. Proposition 172 is a sales tax, one half cent sales tax that's dedicated to public safety departments. For the County of Los Angeles, this funding is traditionally allocated to the Sheriff Department and District Attorney. Um, the next source of major source of funding or revenue source for the department is their various contracts that they have with um, cities. It represents 20% uh, of their budget. And then they have a variety other 
sources of revenue, as you can see laid out before you. Um, the difference between interfund transfers is that that is funding or um, yes, funding that comes from other county departments where revenue is funding that comes into the department from outside of the county, i.e. the state, federal, or other cities, agencies in that nature. Next slide. This is a breakdown of how the funding of the net county cost is funded within the department. And this is broken down by the various budget units. Um, as you can see, um, so much goes to custody. That's the housing of uh, individuals in our jails. We have 22% in patrol. We have um, roughly 1% for county services. That's where we have the Parks Bureau and then other um, security services provided to other um, county departments. We have 11% for their court operations and we have 8% for their administration and we have another 8% for the Detective Bureau. And then we have 23% for general support. And we have um, further defined those different budget units for you, I think, in the next couple of slides. Next slide, Jennifer. So as I mentioned, these are the various budget units and how the funding is broken down. Um, patrol, detective, administration, custody, court, and general support and county services. Next slide. So this provides you with detailed information on what each of those um, budget units represent and how the funding is allocated to provide the various services that the department provides to the County of Los Angeles. As it indicates here, patrol is for um, law enforcement services to contract cities, to Metrolink, MTA, community college districts. And they also have some specialized countywide services listed in there. They have the Detective Bureau, which is primarily responsible for investigation of various criminal activities. They have the administration, which provides administrative services. Next slide. <laughs> Custody is um, for the housing and um, secure housing and care for the um, population sentenced to our county jails. We have the court. This is providing bailiff services to the courts, emit incarceration and security during court proceedings. Next slide. General support. Um, this is all the uh, support services that are provided to the other budget units, um, as well as includes their um, IT communications fleet, um, internal investigation, training, and so forth. And then county services is um, the provision of security services to our county departments, as well as to the parks and recreation area. Next slide. The department, as of supplemental changes, has approximately 17,000 budgeted positions. Of those, um, it indicates about 147, 17,147 are filled. And so they're over, they have approximately uh, a negative 52 in terms of vacancies. Next slide. There were some questions regarding body worn camera and the amount of funding that was um, set aside for the department to move forward with this project. Um, the first um, chart that you have before you is the funding allocation. This is the amount of funds set aside by the board over the past uh, few years, beginning in 2016, 17, and it's broken down between um, one time and ongoing funding. And so as of, uh, 2019, we set aside approximately 21.8 million in one-time funding, 13 million in ongoing funding for a total of approximately 34.8 million in funding for this effort. Um, the next box below or chart below um, provides you with the history of the amount of funding that we have transferred over to the department so they can move forward with this effort. We started um, providing funding to the department in 1819 where we provided 2 million um, in funding so they could address some infrastructure related issues for the rollout of the body worn cameras at the various stations. In 1920, we did an additional budget adjustment where we provided approximately 5.6 million. And then just recently in the supplemental budget that was approved by the board, we transferred um, pretty much the bulk of the remaining funding to the department so they can move forward with the um, implementation of body worn cameras. Next slide. 
So this is um, what the funding will um, provide to the department or cover. It is to offset the cost of approximately 33 staff. It will allow for the procurement of approximately 5,248 devices for the department. And then it's broken down to for you further in terms of what that translates in, in terms of one time and ongoing cost for the department. Next slide. Oh, you skipped one. So um, the department indicates that they plan to roll out um, body worn camera at five stations initially, and those five stations are highlighted in red for you. And then they plan to deploy the remaining body worn cameras to the other stations listed below over the course of the next year. And I think um, there are a couple of specialized bureaus that will then be deployed later. But the goal is to um, roll out cameras um, at all stations um, during this current fiscal year. Next slide. There was questions regarding the mental evaluation teams. So initially the department had a total of 33 teams operational um, during final changes due to a reduction in um, sales tax revenue that we receive um, under Assembly Bill 109, uh, the department had to eliminate funding for six items. Um, that resulted in the uh, reduction in the number of teams available countywide from 33 down to 29. However, in supplemental changes, we were able to identify some funding to restore those positions. And as of supplemental changes, they currently have 33 teams, they have six ramp teams and their operational, their tri triage desk is operational. And I believe that concludes the presentation. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, before we go to um, commissioner questions um, to both you and the sheriff's department, I wanna see if there is a sheriff's representative who wants to, um, briefly address some budget issues. Um, so I'm not sure we have a number of sheriff's representatives here today. Um, I'm not sure who from the sheriff's department wishes to address some budget issues. You wanna identify yourself? Yeah, good morning. This is Conrad Meredith. I'm the division director of our administrative services division. And we have a cadre of personnel here with us today um, to address the uh, other issues that um, you brought to our attention about a month ago. I have Assistant Division Director Glenn Joe is with me here. Assistant Division Director Richard Martinez. I have Captain John McBride, who's over our personnel command. And on the line, we should also have a representative from Custody Division, Commander Sergio Aloma. And we should also have um, Lieutenant John Gannon uh, to address any MET um, questions that you have. And, and Sheila, yeah, the CEO pretty much covered um, the budget, but but just to put some things in perspective for um, the Civilian Oversight Commission regarding the sheriff's budget over the past few years. And um, back in, what, 17, 18, the, the sheriff's department um, was over budget about $20 million. And then 18, 19, that, that ballooned to $90 million. But in the last fiscal year, in the CO's uh, latest report, the Sheriff's Department reduced that deficit to about $35 million. And Could was I interrupt for a moment? This is Commissioner Harris. Uh, I lost all sound for a while, and I don't know if anyone else did too, right after the point where you were introducing everyone. If you could start okay. your presentation over from that point, I'd really appreciate it. Okay. Again, I'm Conrad Meredith, the Division Director of our Administrative Services Division. And I have also have Assistant Division Director Glenn Joe. No, I, I got all that. I got all yeah, the Okay. It's right after that, where I lost you. Okay. Yeah, we were just saying, yeah, the CEO pretty much covered our, our current budget, but we just kind of wanted to put the sheriff's budget uh, kind of in perspective over the past few years, where we have been over budget, you know, for the last um, three years now. Um, in 17, 18, we were about $20 million over budget. 18, 19, we were about $90 million over budget but we just wanted to uh, make sure the CEO or COC um, was aware that we reduced our, our deficit to um, $35 million. So 
So the department is kind of headed in the right direction. So we just wanted to make sure um, you were aware of that. Yeah, and we're currently working with the CEO this current fiscal year, because one question that the uh, commission had was how are we going to meet budget this year? And um, on a daily basis, we're kind of negotiating with the CEO um, right now as we speak. And that's pretty much all I had, had to say unless um, the commission has some questions. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of uh, questions, um, both to Ms. Williams um, and, um, and to the Sheriff's Department. Um, one question um, I'm not sure that Ms. Williams that you addressed is um, if the CEO gives the sheriff a pot of money um, and um, there have to be cuts within the department, is that something that is orchestrated by the CEO or um, does the sheriff make that determination himself? Hi. So. Um... The CEO obviously determines what the budgetary impact um, to the county is for a variety of issues or, or um, economic decline, if you will. So we anticipate that countywide. And based on that number, we then identify what we believe um, needs to be curtailed countywide by all departments. And so during the, um, when COVID-19 initially began, we requested that all departments submit various uh, curtailment scenarios, ranging from 10% all the way up to 20%. This was required by all departments. So while we may set the amount that needs to be curtailed, each department heads submits their own curtailment plan as to how they would achieve that curtailment target. And so that was what uh, occurred during this year with um, COVID-19. The department submitted various plans to our office. We then review them, analyze them, determine what is actually viable, what may not be viable, and then we submit recommendations to the, the board for their consideration and adoption. Um, in this instance, we um, determined after looking at the revenues and projections that only an 8% curtailment was required of all departments. And so that was what we requested from the sheriff department as well as all county departments. They, um, and so that is what we move forward with. However, there were various, um, um, when the department submitted their plan, several programs that they had identified um, were not supported by our office nor the board. And given the significant reduction in the jail population, and because the department was also anticipating layoffs, we um, worked to develop a mitigation plan to address those concerns. And in that instance, we um, determined that we would make the cuts all come from custody and that all layoffs would come from custody. However, um, in supplemental, we then mitigated all layoffs for the department. So those were the decisions that were made by the CEO's office. Um, thank you. Thank you. Lael, it seems you may be on mute. There we go. Thank you for that, Ms. Williams. Um, now we can go to um, other questions from other commissioners. Um, Commissioner Bonner. Yes, uh, this for Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Williams. Uh, a couple of questions. One, uh, you referred to inter inter or inter fund transfers, and I'm just that's about 47 percent of the total budget for the sheriff's department. I'm going to assume that a lot of that includes the contract city uh, funding of the sheriff's department. But uh, is that correct or not? No, so inter fund transfers is money that is um, received from other county departments. Okay, so okay, so it's the fifty three percent actually that you said is county funding. Actually, a lot of that funding comes from uh, contract cities. Yes, the re the revenue, the revenue funding that you see in the department's budget, one of the primary source of revenue funding after accounting for the state proposition 172 is the contract cities. 
All right. So or if, law enforcement services. So if we're looking at that 53% of the $0.58 billion, that 53%, uh, roughly, by the way, give me a ballpark, what percentage of that is contract city of uh, uh, revenue for services rendered by the sheriff's department to contract cities? I'm going back to the uh, slides so I can get that information for you. The exact number. I believe it was 20%. 20% is contract cities. There you could, go. Could, okay, you, could you put the slide of, back up? Yeah, yeah, 20%. percent of the 53%? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Okay, thank you. Uh, All right. Well, I'm going to put the slide up and I'm going to take a quick notes, but. Yes, it's 20%. Okay, so, okay, my other question, uh, uh, you indicated that uh, in terms of the uh, number of uh, FTE or budgeted personnel for the department that it's a slightly over budget really right now, uh, and, and that can be taken care of by attrition. But yes. I have a slightly different question, and that is, first of all, what is the budgeted number of deputies, sworn deputy sheriffs within that 17,095 number? And is that over or on right now? In other words, uh, are all those positions still over or uh, are they under or over? And then that's related to my next question, which is what percentage of the spending of the sheriff's department has been on overtime for what was budgeted and what was spent on overtime. I'm trying, trying, I'm trying to get at the issue of adequate number of personnel as as might be reflected in terms of how much overtime is burned. Right. So you understand where I'm going. Yes, and I, I do not have the breakdown of the staffing between sworn and civilian. And um, I don't know if the sheriff department staff has that number. But um, at this juncture and as of supplemental changes, I would say the department is overstaffed compared to what they have in terms of budgeted number of sworn personnel. Um, and that is because, um, as I mentioned, we did a significant number of cuts to the department and final changes to address the um, economic impact of COVID-19. And then from there to mitigate any layoffs, we use the department's existing vacancies to address that issue. And so as of this juncture, it is my, um, belief that the department is overstaffed with respect to sworn personnel, All right. especially when you take into account those that are currently in the academy. Okay, could you, by the way, uh, not right now, but if you could provide to our executive director just what the, uh, the, the authorized level is, the current staffing level of deputies, you can see that. And also if you could provide the overtime Earn for uh, this would be budgeted for the coming year, but also maybe take a look to help work out in terms of how much was budgeted and how much was actually burned in overtime. Yes, yeah, so thank you. One other question, and then I'll, you know, go ahead. So, with respect to overtime, um, in terms of last year, uh, what was budgeted was approximately 280 yep. million. And the department, um, I'm sorry, what was budgeted was approximately 145 million point five, and the department expended approximately 280 million in overtime. Um, now, one other question, then I'll turn it over to the committee. And I'm pleased that at least teams were not cut. So apparently there's still 33 MET teams out there. But how much way to budgeting to agree to 60 MET teams? That would be an additional 27 MET teams as recommended by the Civilian Oversight Commission. And what, what would that take in terms of additional budget or budget? Um, yeah, I'll have to get back to you on what that, that cost out would be. Right. You don't have a per team cost? No, I do not. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leo. Okay. This is Mr. Harris, I have a question. Is Lael on? Did we lose her? Go ahead, JP. I did get a text message from Lael asking if we're having a WebEx problem, so she may be having a connectivity issue. So okay. Thank, thank you. Um, just and I'll, I'll 
just make a statement to Commissioner Bonner. Now, some of that information, I think um, Lieutenant Gannon from the Met team does have all that, uh, the, the costing in a report that he's provided us. So I think it, I don't think it is available. Um, the, and the question of, of staffing levels, I'm sure uh, Director Meredith can probably answer that question for us now, um, if you'd like that answered. My question is uh, concerning court services, and that is, are we receiving the full amount of money that it costs to run court services from the state, or are we supplementing that contract with county dollars? We are supplementing that contract with county dollars. And to what degree are we supplementing with county dollars? Well, it's it's a uh, you have to look at it from a variety of ways. Um, the there's a a rule in the uh, the law that de determines the amount of staff and which costs are allowable under the, the statute. And so mm -hmm. in addition to that, the department has a MOU with the, with the courts that outline the number of staff that they were, they're required to provide. So when you look at um, what is called rule 810, function eight and allowable costs, and you look at the MOU that the sheriff department has with the trial courts, um, they are currently underfunded by 15.8 million. That's a rough estimate based on some figures that we developed last year. However, when you look at the entire court security services division and what they provide to the courts, we determined that they actually are exceeding those costs by 53.5 million. They're underfunded by 53.5 million. Okay, so so in other words, so I understand this, and it was rule eight point ten function what? Yeah, so rule eight ten, mm -hmm. and function eight outlines which costs are allowable that the um, sheriff department statewide now can charge the courts for security services, and then okay. the staffing plan that the sheriff has per their MOU, which outlines the number of staff that they agreed to provide the courts. When you look at that, those two things, the sheriff is underfunded by approximately 15.8 million or just roughly 16 million. When you compare it to the amount of funding that the um, state was sending down for those services. Okay. You where, add, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Where did the 53.5 million come in? Was that? So I heard when that. You add, so the department also has what they call a court security division. So they have mm -hmm. supervisors, support staff, services, supplies, and vehicles. So obviously when they, you establish a bureau of this size in LA County, they have um, certain costs that they incur. However, the rule, rule 810 does not allow the county to charge for supervision staff above a certain level. So those costs are not allowable. But when you look at the size and scope of the services that the Sheriff Department has to provide to the courts, you cannot establish um, Roughly, I think they provide uh, 1,200 um, staff to the to the courts. They need some sort of supervision level, and from that you have above that you have captains and so forth. When you add all those additional costs, um, they are they are incurring an additional 53.5 million okay. above and beyond what's provided by the um, state. Yeah, in Rule 8.10, what, what is that? The administrative code, a government code, what is that? Um, that is, Rule 8.10 is a judicial council rule. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I have I have finally rejoined. I um, was sort of- Okay, let me just finish. I, I just want to- Are you about point. to finish, JP? Because I know yeah. that- I've Commissioners want to speak. I understand. Um, I guess I'm just very concerned that it seems patently ridiculous to me that we are spending $53.5 million for a function of which if we did not have a contract with the state, we would not have a court services division. We have no reason for a court services division since the state took over trial courts unless we have a contract with the state. So for us to have to absorb 
$53.5 million for supervision and SNS and vehicles for a division that we wouldn't even need period if we didn't have that contract. It seems to me like we might want to consider to find somebody else to run their trial courts in the county of Los Angeles. Uh, just an observation. If we're dying for money, I don't know why we're paying for all this stuff. That, that's the state's responsibility, not ours. I'm done. All right. Any other commissioners before we go to public comment? Yes. Um, yeah. I'm, any, I'm sorry. Any other commissioners? Priscilla, go ahead. I, I can't unmute myself. You're unmuted. you. Okay, uh, mine says I'm muted. Okay, um, so um, I have a couple of questions about the MET teams. What is the, the total budget uh, for those 33 MET teams that you mentioned, um, Ms. Williams? Mm, let me see if I could get that information quickly for you. And no, I do not have that readily available. Okay. Does Lieutenant, does Lieutenant Gannon have that? He's, he's on. I'm wondering if he has that for us. Yes. Hi, okay. Lieutenant Gannon here with Sheriff's Met team. Uh, good morning. And yes, based on the information that I have here in front of me, it's approximately with 66 LASD staff, approximately 17 million in total. That includes all overhead expenditures, vehicles, everything else, and staff salary and benefits. Thank you. Um, my other question is about, um, I know this is, it doesn't fall directly under the sheriff's department or maybe it does, uh, is this cost for, um, uh, medical care in the jail, particularly for CHS, um, and if there's any separate costs for provision of, um, mental health support for people who are in the jail facilities. Yes, so yes. there's a separate budget unit called ICHS, which provides for the medical services for those in the in the jails. And then there's also a component that's charged um, by DMH for mental health services provided to those in the jail. Do you happen to know, um, I know that there may be separate, but do you happen to know what the total cost is for ICHS? Uh, and the no, um, those services fall under DHS, so we would have to get that information from them. Okay, thank you. As well as from DMH. Okay, and then I have a, a couple of um, questions about um, specialized units or subdivisions. Um, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, there was a fatal, uh, there was a, a deputy shot and killed a patient at a hospital uh, recently. Um, and I wanted to ask if you had a breakdown of the cost of, so JP asked about the courts. I'm interested in things like the substations in the hospitals. Um, how much does that cost? Uh, are those contracted? How much money comes in? Um, from the, the, I know these are often county facilities. Um, and then um, I have questions about whether there is a specialized unit for traffic enforcement and what the costs are for uh, uh, funding those kinds of uh, um, uh, services uh, uh, from the sheriff's department. So hospital um, uh, substations and uh, traffic enforcement. Yeah, that level of detailed information would need to come from the sheriff department. Okay. We provide a, we budget at a much higher level. Oh, okay. Um, is there anybody from the sheriff's department that, that handles the budget that happens to know uh, the answer to those questions? Okay. Excuse me, what, what was the question again? The question was uh, the cost of um, uh, specific substations at places like hospitals. Um, if there's a, if that cost is, is separately um, broken down in the sheriff's budget, and if so, how much um, funding goes toward providing those kinds of specialized services? Um, and then second, how much does the sheriff's department expend on uh, traffic enforcement, or if there's a special traffic uh, enforcement uh, division or, or bureau, or if that's simply a part of uh, patrol? Yeah. So the answer to the last question that yes, that would be a, a, a cost component separately of patrol. Uh, so we'd have to get, you know, look at that. But in terms of your question regarding uh, security provided at the hospitals or law enforcement services, that is a function that we provide through our county services bureau. Uh, and we'd have to, you know, um, go back and pull that information for you. But as Ms. Williams mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there are, contracts that we have with various county departments 
uh, where we receive revenue for the services that we provide. And this is one of those examples of the security and law enforcement services that we provide at the hospitals. Um, so we could, you know, work internally to pull those numbers, um, but that is something that we, we could have for okay. you. Thank you, I'd appreciate that. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, the last, sorry, the last question I have is about um, liabilities for misconduct. Um, do you, does that include as part of the sheriff's budget or um, is that a sep is that a separate line item in, in the county's budget? It's included in the sheriff's department's budget. Those uh, costs are billed back to the sheriff's department. And how much um, in, in the last fiscal year was billed back uh, to the sheriff's department for um, liabilities, uh, like lawsuits? Let me see if I have that for you. That was that was in one of the slides earlier slides, Sheila. Yeah, but that's a that's a overall. There's a specific line item for judgment and damages. Um, I don't have that readily available. Okay, and and sorry, my last question is more just a, a broader policy question. Oh, I'm sorry. It was approximately thirty nine point eight million. Is that the estimate you guys um, have as well, Sheriff? I, I think yeah, that's about, that, that is about right, Sheila. I mean, that is that is something that we've been dealing with extensively over the last couple of years, but we did see a dip in those costs last fiscal year. Yeah, so it's approximately forty million for last fiscal year. Okay, and then and my last question is, uh, you mentioned that there's a, a, a say, there's a, a funding that goes toward the district attorney and the sheriff's department from that 1% or that 1 cent uh, sales tax. Um, yeah, Proposition 172. Proposition 172. Um, and I was wondering um, uh, why the, the um, LA Public Defender's Office was not included in that, or are they, is that just a function of their funded, there's a separate mechanism for, for funding for the, um, public defender. So when the sales tax, the half cent sales tax was initiated, um, the board of supervisors could determine who they wanted to allocate those funds to. At that time, um, when it was initiated, I think it was back in 1996, 97, the board selected the district attorney and the sheriff department. And is that, some, is that something that can be changed? Is that, or is that sort of fixed? Uh, that, we are working with county council to determine that because that question has been posed to us by the board office. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. your presentation, Ms. Williams. Thank you, Ms. Williams. I think, and um, um, Mr. Conrad and, and Lieutenant Gannon um, and anybody else from the Sheriff's Department, right now, um, I'd like to um, ask Jennifer to see if we have any requests for public comment well, on this issue. Well, I had my hand up for a question. Oh, I'm sorry. And this is Jennifer. I just want to chime in. We only have two uh, members of the public who have signed up to comment on this. Patty okay, and Sarah's raised. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williams. This is very uh, illuminating. Um, oh and very glad, uh, of course, we're very glad to see that the MET teams um, were uh, reinstated up to the 33. So, 33. so, my question is for both you and Lieutenant Gannon, since our recommendation, uh, we and we do know that the Board of Supervisors has taken this recommendation um, to between 60 and 80 is um, is our estimation of what would be adequate. Um, is there any plans for stair stepping or increasing along with this new concept of alternative crisis response? I think um, um, at this point, you know, looking at uh, the continuing with Matt, but also bringing in some other, reimagining some other ways to do these responses. Since people with um, mental illness, mental breakdown, substance abuse issues are very vulnerable. Um, and we, you know, we really want trained personnel. Um, uh, we want the teams, we want trained clinical people. We also, evident and, and when. Uh, law enforcement is involved. We want trained, very specially trained law enforcement deputies to be engaged as as guardians, as protectors, as and for those rare instances where they may be necessary to intervene. So I'm just wondering 
when you look at budgets, do you pro do you prognosticate? You know, I mean, do you think of moving ahead? Um, how does that work between a department's vision and um, the vision for budgeting for the county? No, so our office was well aware that the board supported um, an increase in the number of MET teams as well as the host teams um, ran by the sheriff department. Um, and so obviously we're working to look to see how that how we could fund an increase in those staff. Unfortunately, COVID-19 hit and we had an economic um, issues, um, you know, nationwide. And so at this time, we're just trying to stabilize our budget. Um, However, as additional resources come in, everything that um, the board directs us to do, we will look into in terms of trying to address um, funding for um, ATI initiatives. We've set aside funding for that in our, as part of our supplemental changes budget. We've hired an ATI director who would hopefully assist us in determining what are the, the priorities we should look at first in terms of implementation with respect to that initiative. So we are always looking to address the concerns and, and priorities of the board as well as the department. However, given limited funding, as well as where we are currently with our economy, um, it just may not be feasible at this time. And I guess, uh, Lieutenant Gannon, um, do you are you still working your plan, the strategic plan to um, continue when it's possible to increase uh, MET and the training of uh, of um, deputies? Yes, yeah, so Lieutenant Gannon on the line. We continue to submit each year at recommended budget our request to reach incrementally the 60 units. Our next proposed growth benchmark would be to 45 units. So we have worked out incremental um, additions and the cost for that to reach that goal. And then eventually, uh, originally what was part of what we called the five year plan. Years four and five, we've been frozen for the past two years, but we'll continue to submit those budget requests. Uh, and given what's happening right now with the, the county's budget, uh, we're being patient. Um, with regard to the alternative crisis response that you mentioned, Commissioner Giggins, I just wanted to mention that we are part of that as well, that initiative, and MET is very much a part of the future of the alternative crisis response. MET is not patrol. MET is a specialized resource and a co-responder with the clinician and training that exceeds 800 hours just in the first year alone. And the MET units are currently the only type of mental health response unit available countywide, including DMH's own resources, MET is the only units that can still go to a call that is considered dangerous and in progress and a, sus a suspect or patient may be wielding a weapon still at the time MET arrives. And because we're arriving sooner now to our call since the expansion in these past few years, this is becoming a very real issue on an almost daily basis as recent as last night, uh, we handled one like this. So. We are getting the calls quicker. We are helping to de-escalate those calls and reduce suicide by cop, uh, as well as uh, potentially fatal encounters during fights with deputies, because we often can de-escalate these calls before it results in a use of force. So I don't see MET going away. I think we're a strong part of the ACR. Dr. Sharon said we are part of the overall response system for LA County. Uh, that, that, of course, is augmented then by PMRT and other co-response teams that does not involve law enforcement. And our focus will remain what we call 911 level response to crises at uh, the highest level, what we categorize level four or five on a, on a one to five scale. So our, our purpose won't go away and our need will remain even with the ACR initiative. That's great, um, Lieutenant Gannon. I, I continue to be impressed with the work that you do um, and um, it's needed now more than ever. So. Thank you very much for spelling that out. And um, at this point, I'd like to uh, um, ask um, Vice Chair Vera if he has any questions. I do, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Williams, for, for the presentation. We've been looking forward to this and we look forward to uh, to following up and, and working with you as, as we dig deeper on this. Um, my first question is essentially more about process. Um, each year when you are looking at the proposed budget that uh, LA Sheriff's Department sends to the um, executive office and the other county departments, 
what criteria do you use to um, look at the appropriateness um, of any particular budget categories? Uh, patrol ratios, um, asset expenditures, leases, et cetera. Is there, is there any uh, personnel that are dedicated to that or are there other criteria that you use to do an analysis of the appropriateness of the budget request? So we look at a variety of factors when evaluating a department's request. Obviously, is it um, critical? Um, and that can be determined by a variety of things. Um, litigation, um, we look at board priorities and initiative. We look at our strategic goal. Is it in line with that? And then, of course, once we determine that something is critical, we then begin working with the departments to get whatever supporting information that we need to do a detailed analysis. And that includes workload stats, number of personnel currently assigned, and what's the, the ratio, um, what's the workload data, um, anything that can help us determine what would be um, an appropriate response to that department's request. Um, sometimes we have sufficient time to do detailed analysis and sometimes we don't given the criticality of the, the issue before us. And so we look at a variety of factors to help us determine what's appropriate and what to recommend to the board. Um, obviously, um, Given limited resources, we're not always able to address a department's um, request. Oftentimes, um, with the sheriff, we would ask him what is his specific priority, and so we would tend to focus our attention on those requests. Um, and then we we look at what we have available. We look at other competing interests from other county departments. The sheriff is not the only department asking for funding, um, and uh, what what I think um, a lot of folks fail to understand is that. We generally have very limited dollars available and we get over 2 billion in budget requests countywide. And so we cannot obviously address all those things. So we have to make some, some choices. And so not everyone receives what they ask for. And then you're muted. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, uh, it, it just occurs to me that many of the requests for the various budget categories require a certain level of expertise in law enforcement. And I don't mean this as a criticism at all. Everyone at the county does, does great work on this. But has the county ever retained a consultant or other outside experts with law enforcement expertise to do a deep dive of those budget requests of the budget to find out to to provide any recommendations to the board about the appropriateness of any budget requests for the sheriff's all department. the time all the time and prime example it was with the body worn camera um, as you know under sheriff mcdonald uh, the initial budget request submitted to our office was was significant i think it ranged between 75 to 100 million um, we had retained an outside consultant to assist us to determine whether or not that was um, an accurate reflection of what was needed by the department at that time. We then had a change in administration and Villanueva came in with a different proposal and a different cost estimate. It was significantly lower. So that also concerned us. So we retained an outside consultant to help us understand what was appropriate to move forward and they determined um, the amounts that you see reflected in our, our budget um, that was allocated to the department and in the presentation that I provided today. Uh, terrific, well, thank you. I, I would uh, ask our executive director, hopefully um, our staff can follow up with you, Ms. Williams, to get any other uh, studies like that for our staff to review. I think it'd be very helpful for us to see what other recommendations have been made by consultants over the years, say over the last 10 years, I think it'd be incredibly helpful for us to have the um, have those reports. Um, next, Mr. Williams, I have, I have questions about how the budgeting is done. Uh, I've heard sort of offhand over the years um, a, a criticism or, or a concern, I should say, that when um, when for a particular budget category the um, the county moves funds into whatever the designated account is for the sheriff's department that it has very little ability if any 
to control whether the funds are actually used for that intended purpose, other than cross category transfers, which I, I know are prohibited. Uh, what I heard, and again, this is just, uh, you know, third hand, but that the county has very little ability to control whether the, let's say for parks or for some other budget category, whether the uh, sheriff actually uses the funds as uh, originally budgeted. Uh, is is that a concern? Is that uh, a, a true statement or um, or not? I would say over the years, um, several board members have expressed that concern about whether or not funds allocated to the department was used as intended. Um, yes, we um, allocate the funds to different buckets to try to address and alleviate those concerns of the board members. Um, and that is what we've done in terms of putting funding specifically in what we call a, a parks bureau. I mean, uh, specifically for parks and county services. And that's what we've done when we set up the patrol budget unit and develop separate, separate unique budget buckets for unincorporated area patrol separated from the contract city's budget so that the board could see that we've allocated funding for this specific purpose. As you mentioned, operationally, we cannot control what the sheriff does, but that is what we can do from our perspective with respect to the budget in terms of separating out the funding, saying to the department that it's, it's supposed to be used for this intended purpose, and that's what the budget units are designed to do. And um, even if you don't have the control, have, does anybody go back and do a check at the end of a budget year to see, at least for record keeping purposes, what uh, types of funds or amounts of funds were not expended for their intended uses? So at year end, you know, we do year end closing and we can see the actuals of the department and where they hit and how they compare to the budget. And so, yes, we've done that type of analysis. We've seen um, various discrepancies. However, um, we have to be mindful that um, departments do need some flexibility and some um, nimbleism, if you will, to be able to respond to crisis that may occur during the year. I.e. fires, I um, addressing the protests, security for protests and things of that nature. So we do understand that departments, not only the sheriff, but all county departments need to have some ability to be flexible to respond, whatever emerging crisis may occur during the year. Understood. Thank you. Um, and, and again, uh, Mr. Williams, maybe we can get those reports as well to, to see what um, what cost categories or items have not been expended, that would be useful. Um, Ms. Williams, I am informed that there is a category of funds that come from AB 109, where the county has essentially a pay first, reimburse later model for uh, certain sheriff's department funds. Is that is that true? Yes, so um, AB 109 is allocated to departments on a reimbursement basis. They have to submit claims um, outlining what the funding was, um, what they expended the funds on, and if it was in alignment with the AB 109 purpose, and then we reimburse them via claims. We keep getting muted here. And, and is that the only category where that model is used? And I guess my follow up on that is. Would there be anything prohibiting the county from expanding that model of reimbursement to other cost categories to to be a better fiscal manager and avoid budget overruns? Um, from trying to think um, historically, yes, that is the only place where that well that model is used by by our office specifically. Um, and that is because those funds were allocated to us from the state and the board directed us to ensure that those funds were spent in a certain manner. And so we set up the reimbursement and claiming process. And the purpose was twofold, not only to make sure the funds were expended as intended, but also to demonstrate to the state whether or not they were appropriately funding us for the operations and functions and services that they transferred down from the state to the county. 
Um, I will say this, that that can be a labor intensive process. So I'm not sure if that's something we would want to implement for departments countywide for all of their programs. Um, but it could be something that we use for specific and unique situations. Okay, thank you. No, so it, it can be done. No, I understand that it would be time intensive, but it could be expanded so that uh, the uh, the county could have more control over the budget process. Correct. That's that's a way of of looking at it. I mean, however, we do already have certain controls, like we mentioned, the different buckets and 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 budget units. And so, um, if if it's specific to the sheriff department, that's one thing. I, I'm not sure if you're talking about countywide. I'm talking just now for for the sheriff's department, but it would okay. be a, a good idea for for other departments as well. A, a corollary question, Ms. Williams, on that topic: um, Does the county ever specifically earmark funds for certain purposes? And, and let's put aside the body worn cameras, but has it in the last five or ten years specifically earmarked funds and said these fifty million dollars shall be used for this and this only? I mean, when we allocate funds to the department, that's that's what we're doing. So if you, you look at our budget book, we would say um, funding is being allocated to the sheriff department to implement the body worn camera program. So um, anytime we allocate funds to the department, we specify what the intent is and and that's what we we do on an ongoing basis. So um, if you mean in terms of setting aside funding and then making them claim for it or what specifically are you? I mean, in, in, let's say in, um, in certain types of buckets to say the services are for this station and this station and this station or for this park station, as opposed to on the whole parks gets this much or custody gets this yeah. much. Yeah, so we don't, we do not budget at that level of detail. Um, we budget at a much higher level and then it's the departments, um, then the department internally um, budgets at the lower level to have that type of detail available for them in terms of how they allocate the funding. But historically and, and currently, the CEO budgets at a much higher level. Okay, I'd like to, Ernan, I'd like to move to, um, okay. um, to take public comment. Um, Thank you. Thank just, you, Ms. Williams. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairperson Rubin. Chairperson Rubin? Yes. Hi, this is Captain John McBride with the uh, Sheriff's Department, and we we would respectfully request: to, Can we participate uh, a, prior uh, to going to public comments and and uh, participate in the discussion in light of uh, some of the comments that were made? Um, you know, let's see what the, the the answer is. Yes, but let's see what the public comment is first. Um, because it may make more we'll sense. Come back to you uh, because there's... I had. I had um, asked initially um, for some sheriff's department input that doesn't um, preclude you from, you know, you um, responding at this point. But if you can hold that for just a second while we explore what the public comment is, Jennifer. Right. And we, we also want to be able to respond to the public comments and, and um, there, there is. Um, uh, we'd like to, if we're talking about the sheriff's budget, so we're hoping that the, the sheriff could actually participate in this. Well, we certainly would welcome the sheriff to participate, but um, let's hear from the public comment and then we'll come back to you. Jennifer. Thank you, Chairperson. We do have three individuals signed up for public comment, but first an announcement in Spanish. Buenos días. Si necesita que alguien traduzca su comentario en español, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de empezar y cuando termine su comentario, alguien traducirá su comentario. Wonderful. And we have three individuals signed up. Leo, will we be doing um, two minutes? Let's, oh. let's do two minutes. Thank you. Okay. And our first public comment will. Audrey George. Audrey, you are unmuted. Please go ahead with your public comment. Um, you can hear me? Yes, we hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Thanks. I reject any effort to present a case for the LASD being underfunded, and I support the demand for defunding the LASD budget. To start with, 
COC must align with the growing call from community medical professionals and the board of supervisors in their support of the CARES first budget, prioritizing alternatives to public safety and community based systems of care. The funds that are currently allocated to support the presence of law enforcement in the hospital should immediately be reallocated to support alternatives to crisis response. LASD continues to fail on all fronts in this matter at the cost of the safety and well being of our communities. Instead of focusing on an in depth and unbiased investigation, Sheriff Villanueva minimized a recent excessive use of force shooting by deputies. Yet another instance of his outrageous efforts to criminalize and dehumanize the victims and to further stigmatize beloved community members who seek support to manage their mental health. We should also get LASD out of traffic enforcement, such as the stop that resulted in community in deputies murdering Dijon Kizzy for an alleged vehicle code infraction, apparently riding a bicycle in the op in the opposite direction. And finally, the COC should also strongly recommend that the BOS support the funding and establishment of the Public Defender's Office Law Enforcement Accountability Unit. Thank you. And our next public comment will come from Gina. Gina, please go ahead with your comment. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to echo absolutely everything that the last speaker said, Audrey George, I would second all of that. Also, where is the sheriff today? How do we continue to have meetings of such vital importance about how the sheriff's department operates and he continues not to show up to these meetings? I find it very unusual that someone from his department interrupted to state, will the sheriff be able to speak to this? Where is the sheriff? Even when subpoenaed for these meetings, he doesn't come. If you had a CEO of a company who refused to participate in board meetings that were about COVID compliance in the jails, the budgeting process, that CEO would not be long for the job. So I'm, I'm very concerned about why he continues to deny showing up to these meetings. Why would we continue to fund departments that are continually killing community members? No other department would receive this much of the budget if all they did was fall down on their jobs. Killing members of the community at a rate, a rate larger than anyone else in the country should be grounds to halt everything that happens so things can be reevaluated. And speaking specifically to the budget, I find it very troubling that there are 17,000 people employed in the sheriff's department and not a single one of them specializes in this budgeting process. How can that be that we have to go to outside, uh, outside forces to figure out if our budgeting process is effective? That's just so troubling to me, 17,000 people find one that is a budget uh, expert in sheriff's budgets. Uh, AB 109, those funds should be, should none of those funds should go to the sheriff's department. All of those funds should go to the uh, ODR, the Office of Diversion and Reentry. So I'm glad that that was brought up here today and I hope that something is done to take measures about that. Also strangely missing Thank from this you. budget is a line item for, law, for litigation and lawsuits. Thank you. Thank you. And the next public comment will come from Alex Cave. Alex, please go ahead with your comment. Thank you so much for letting me speak. And I want to echo everything that the last two speakers said. They were absolutely on point of the CARES First initiative and crisis response management going to something outside of the Sheriff's Department. As someone who's participated in peaceful protests for the past months since George Floyd has been killed, I have seen gross um, misuse of sheriff's funds with say 30 to 40 sheriff's officers in full riot gear with sound cannons uh, loaded weapons at these peaceful protests including a dance and i just imagine the 23 million for large items like heat like a heat ray with sound cannons and 39.8 million for misconduct what that could do for the community if it wasn't used for this oversight you don't need 40 sheriff's officers for a peaceful protest every single week. I mean, imagine the amount of money and overtime that's going into these officers that don't need to be there and treat us like we are a threat. They aren't there to protect us 
from white supremacists attacking us. They're there to make us feel bad. I've watched my friends be attacked by tear gas, by rubber bullets. I mean, this is a police state we're in. And Alex Villanueva, I thank um, Commissioner Boner for asking for his resignation. I mean, he doesn't even care about the city and 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 what his officers are doing. This is this is crucial right now for us to put our community first and to not treat Los Angeles like it is a police state. So I ask that you please um, vote for programs that, that go into our community to protecting our homeless people and not sweeps um, that, that go into transparency and oversight with the district attorney and to please uh, vote for people like the, the having the public defender um, use oversight and transparency. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it appears that we do have quite a few um, additional public I'm not sure if there is an error in the system or if folks are just signing on late, but we do have a couple of uh, other public individuals who have raised their hand for public comment. Next, we have Elena Schumer. Please go ahead with your comment, Elena. Thank you. Um, I just also want to agree that the care first um, needs to be our priority. I think at this moment, we need to think that we're going through a systematic change as, as a community, as, as Los Angeles, as a state, as California, and as a country. We need to move away from militarization and move towards um, caring for people and, and putting non-militarized people on uh, situations and calls and maybe make it change the funding so that we can have a new number that we can call for people that um, need our help, that it is not a situation where anybody with a gun should be there, including protests, uh, mental health issues, homelessness. And, and we, we're just repeating the same thing over and over. And I, and I think that we need to really think of this as a fundamental change as a, a humanitarian society and look at ourselves with new principles. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Matt, Mark, Mark Anthony Johnson. Please go ahead with your comment, Mark Anthony. Good morning, Commissioners. Mark Anthony Johnson, Frontline Wellness Network. You know, the recent shooting at Harbor UCLA Hospital has really sparked outrage and pain amongst the healthcare community. Uh, folks are really calling for sheriffs to be removed from our care settings. And if you look at the brutality of that shooting, I think it's important for you all as commissioners to know that every day when you talk to providers in these facilities, they say they deal with these type of incidents every single day, multiple times a day, and they never need a gun, a taser, or a badge. Uh, instead, we had a situation where a patient was shot in a facility that committee members should be able to trust, they can be safe in, and you should know that he is currently in critical condition. There wasn't enough blood at the hospital to save this man's life. They had to bring in blood from other facilities uh, to save this man's life. That is the cost of having sheriffs who are trained to kill in our places of care when we have other mechanisms that work, when we have other mechanisms that are successful on a daily basis. And so when we think about this budget, I encourage you to continue to lean into these questions about the contracts and the allocations of sheriff presence in our care facilities, but also know that it's bigger than a shooting. It's about the presence of sheriffs that intimidate healthcare providers to hand over sensitive patient information that the sheriffs can then use to charge people when they should be diverted into things like treatment. Uh, it's about the ways in which uh, when sheriffs are designated to intervene, they aggravate crisis and are often ill-equipped to respond in ways that are helpful. Uh, I have not yet met a, a healthcare provider who has said, yes, the sheriffs are helpful in responding to the critical crisis that we know how to do with our life-saving hands every day. And so the question of the budget is a critical one, and we ask you to continue to lean in and remove the allocations uh, and recommend that these allocations be, be moved towards uh, the life-saving hands of healthcare providers who do this work on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Q. Jean-Marie. Go ahead with your comment, Pastor Q. Yes. Um, I would like to say uh, on the line item for the budget, I didn't see a line item for pensions. Uh, we know that if we continue to build our sheriff department and law enforcement, we're going to have to pay 
uh, all these pensions uh, coming up, and that's going to be huge. I'm not even sure the current system is sustainable with that. And that is why we always say uh, uh, divert from law enforcement into other community uh, uh, you know, apparatuses that can take care of our people. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the fact that the law, that the uh, sheriff continues to not show up at this meeting shows his authoritarian tactics, right? He wanna do whatever he wants to do and doesn't wanna be held accountable. And he shows a total disdain for this group because this group is supposedly called a civilian oversight commission. And it's not just the folks that agree with him. So he doesn't wanna show up. And lastly, uh, just changing the names of teams to hope teams and all of that. We have experience with that in Skid Row, right? The name changing something to hope doesn't mean it brings hope, right? The current shooting, I heard the gentleman was shot nine times. The individual was shot nine times. I mean, if someone is having a, a an episode, a mental illness episode, they need to be shot nine times to subdue them. And then they said the tasers did not work. Well, the tasers never worked. So why did we even put that item and allow law enforcement to have tasers in the first place? The only thing we should allow law enforcement to have are guns because that's the only thing they use. And that should show you how brutal our system is. It's ridiculous for us to think that a bullet can uh, rectify and resolve all of uh, our issues. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Yvette Alley. Please go ahead with your comment, Yvette. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Yvette Alley. I'm the senior policy lead at Dignity and Power Now. We're an organization that advocates for the rights of incarcerated people and their loved ones and the survivors of sheriff violence. And today, since we're talking about the budget, I I'd like to address fiscal responsibility. The sheriff's department over and over again has demonstrated that they lack the ability to adequately manage their funding. And we're talking about taxpayer funding. Last year alone, they accounted for 55% of the entire county's liability costs. That amounted to over $81 million. If this was a private company that was sucking resources at this level and failing to meet their requirement of public safety, this company would have gone belly under. But we're talking about public dollars, our community's dollars that are largely going to fund a sheriff's department that inflicts terror and violence on our communities. AB 109 dollars in particular are not being used for their intended purpose of reducing re recidivism. A large part of those dollars are going to sheriff overtime pay. That is just one example of the funding streams that this sheriff, the sheriff's department is monopolizing that should be going to our communities. And that doesn't even account the priceless lives of our community members that are taken from us every day. The breadwinners that are taken from their families, the loved ones that are incarcerated, that are costing us hundreds of dollars each day to incarcerate, that can be better treated in the community through programs provided by the Office of Diversion and Reentry, who only receives less than 5% of AB 109 funding. We should be investing in the programs and the methods that work. Uh, diversion works, mental health treatment works, drug treatment works. The sheriff's department does not work for public safety. So please invest in the things that work for our county. Thank you. And the next comment will come from TK. Please go ahead with your comment. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm offended y'all do the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of this. You don't even recognize the fact you're on stolen land. So it's offensive. We're on Turtle Island. Second of all, the budget is ridiculous. $3.582 billion. And then you wonder how black and brown communities are underserved and marginalized through food deserts, uh, et poor education, lack of housing, lack of medical care. 3.582 billion is going to a military militarized force to terrorize, target, and murder black, brown, and folks in our communities. You're stealing our loved ones. 
Somebody was shot on 110th in Figueroa last night. They murdered someone having a mental health crisis at the UCLA Harbor Hospital. Imagine if there were mental health workers that were unarmed. Imagine if there were housing coordinators helping the 70,000 homeless people that are on our streets. How is it that we can afford $3.582 billion, but we can't feed or house people? And you're criminalizing mental health here. We absolutely need to defund the sheriff. Villanueva needs to be fired. He needs to go. And we need to put that money in the CARES First budget. We need that money in our communities. We need to defund the sheriff. And two minutes is not nearly enough time to unpack all the information we were given on the budget and to speak uh, on topic about it in full scope. So defund the sheriff, put that money back in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Sophia Lee. Please go ahead with your comment, Sophia. Hi, good morning, commissioners. Um, and like you said, my name is Sophia Lee. I heard a lieutenant say earlier that the MET teams are able to reduce use of force. And I just want to emphasize that's that's not enough. If I or one of my loved ones is having a mental health emergency, I don't care how much training someone has. I don't care who else is also there. I don't want a fucking cop, much less an armed cop, to be there. I'm not interested in lessening the number of people killed. No one should be killed by law enforcement, period. I, I challenge the notion that there's ever a case where that's justified and the fact that officer-involved shootings has become so normalized is disturbing. I, I really encourage, um, similar to how the Board of Supervisors moved on Tuesday to get LASD out of county parks, we should also get LASD out of county hospitals. Um, I also ask that the commissioners make a recommendation to support the funding and establishment of the Public Defender's Office uh, Law Enforcement Accountability Unit. Um, the request for funds was originally refused by the CEO as part of the supplemental budget. But of all the stakeholders in the justice system, the Public Defender's Office is uniquely situated to expose police misconduct um, in the open forum of the county courthouses especially since the public defender does not rely on police endorsements to gain or remain in office. And um, the public defender does not get distracted from seeking out misconduct because of political considerations. Lastly, I ask that the commissioners include a direct ask for the immediate resignation of Sheriff Villanueva and the proposed resolution. The resolution should be a clear vote of no confidence in the current sheriff. Only through a change in leadership can we assure life-saving reform. Alex Villanueva has been nothing but a bully and someone who has allowed police murder to continue. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Andres Kwan. Please go ahead with your comment, Andres. Andres Kwan, I'm a lawyer with the ACLU. <clears throat> Commissioners, uh, I don't need to sound like a broken record here about why and how we reimagine public safety and health. Uh, through the care first model, the board has adopted and has to implement now. Just suffice to say that cages are not the answer. <laughs> and while the sheriff claims to want to save precious taxpayer resources, he only means that when it's about life giving community building services and programs. Mm -hmm. Apparently, we cannot afford that. But when it's about the largest LASD deficit ever under his administration and he's wasting millions in legal fees and payouts, and litigating for more than a year to try to illegally rehire his good friend, Carmen Doyen, he clearly does not care about the budget. And let me remind us that the sheriff deputies have killed 10 Angelinos since the murder of George Floyd, including the John Z. That is not public safety. And people have died in the jails from COVID-19, and that is not public health. Um, the CEO's presentation identified that about a quarter of LAC's personnel is in patrol. And according to 2018 data from LASD, about 70% of people LAC stopped were stopped for traffic violations. A significant amount of traffic violations is for equipment and not moving violations. And all of this disproportionately impacting black and brown people. As Audrey George said, LAZ kill, killed the John Z for an alleged vehicle code infraction. LAZ also killed Paul Rea in a routine traffic stop. LAC has been using alleged violations of the vehicle code to stop and harass and brutalize and kill black and brown people for far too long. But here's the thing, we don't need to keep letting this happen. 
The sheriff only has authority to enforce the vehicle code in county highways by approval of the board pursuant to government code section 26613. The board has an ordinance in the books for that, but we can repeal that. As part of our reimagining public safety and health in our county, we strongly urge you to study and submit this recommendation to the board. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Joseph Gomez. Please go ahead with your comment, Joseph. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, um, so I'm here today because um, as I do support the sheriff, I do ask that you reduce the budget for the sheriff's department. Um, I do ask that you do not remove sheriff's the hospital and or the parks. As uh, one of the speakers said before that uh, care first, um, jail last the new initiative, and they said the board of supervisors, that's their initiative. Um, if they're so care first, jail last, I want to know why they proposed that on the 4th of July, the sheriff um, does cite and, and or arrest some people who are on the beach. Um, why would you arrest those people for violating or making nonviolent crimes when there's uh, violent crime offenders out on the streets who you shall be arresting? Uh, the shooting of Dijon Kizzy and or Paul Rea, I think we have forgot that they were both armed. There's multiple videos that have came out of Dijon Kizzy reaching for the firearm and pointing at sheriff deputies. Our sheriff deputies are not on suicide missions and they will not wait for you to shoot at them first. They will not wait for you to shoot at them first. And I'll say it again, they will not wait for you to shoot at them first. If you have a gun, you will be shot. There's no, there's no de-escalating somebody with the gun and pointing it at you. And I want you to know that you're a lawyer and you should know that. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Daniel Robinson. Please go ahead with your comment, Daniel. Yeah, hi, I was uh, personally affected by, by this issue as a mentor of a young man in South Central Los Angeles uh, who is black and who was his life was kind of, uh, he didn't have all the resources he needed to succeed in life. And we'd gotten him on track. He was graduating high school. He had a mental health crisis. Uh, the sheriff's department got involved. Uh, he was violently arrested and processed. And the trauma that uh, that happened to him as a result of that, it took us a long time to recover from it and we're still dealing with it. And so while I, while I applaud efforts to, to implement, I'm not sure what the term was. I'm sorry, this is my first time in one of these meetings, but the, um, the nonviolent mental health interventionists. I feel like if you just look at the budget and you kind of see where their priorities are, the sheriff's department is always going to have to prioritize um, the funding of incarceration and the funding of what they call patrol, which you know I feel like is just another code word for armed intervention. And those people, um, when when there's budget crisis, which I know COVID nineteen is an extenuating circumstances that we all hope never happens again, but there's always going to be budget crisis. And the mental health services and these nonviolent responses, they're going to be the first thing to go or to cut, where they have to use their discretion on a lower level, as we heard from the CEO, uh, to move those budgetary dollars where they want to spend them, where their priority is. So I really feel like if we want these things uh, to improve within our community, we have to defund the sheriff's department or take away those tasks from them and fund them on their own um, as a major priority, because we could just see from where their budget priorities are that those things are going to be the first cut, and we're going to continue to see people who need help getting harmed further. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Mark Gale. Please go ahead with your comment, Mark. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Please go ahead. Okay, so um, we recently sent a letter to the COC regarding the death of Eric Crescino and training at Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. We had a constructive phone call with Lieutenant Gannon yesterday, as a matter of fact, and some of our internal issues regarding our participation in the training. Um, we had a, a, a good dialogue about that. Um, we, we support the MET teams, and we think we need to move to 60 MET teams. Because when the MET teams show up, I, I believe the data will show uh, that less people get hurt, less people get shot. Uh, and um, that is vital. Um, you know, now we had the incident last night. All I know is what I read in the paper. I don't know whether the officer that uh, did the shooting uh, had been trained, was a veteran officer, new officer, had gone through 32 hours. I uh, we. Do you have questions that the training for veteran officers of only eight hours is inadequate and it's not enough? It's clear the sheriff's department is um, 
taking their uh, budget that they have and re you know doing what they can with the funds that are there. And if you want uh, veteran officers to potentially get 16 hours instead of eight, they need more money. You, if they if you have less shootings, you don't have to spend forty dollars on litigation. I have to make one quick comment on Sheriff Nueva's statement about the person being like the Shining. Uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining represented a psychopath. People with mental illness are not psychopaths. They are people with serious mental illness in crisis, and perhaps the sheriff needs to take his own 32-hour training program uh, to gain the empathy and non. And we would ask him. Do not speak about people with mental illness in such a stigmatizing manner. It's completely inappropriate. Thank you. And the next comment will come from M W. Please go ahead with your comment, M W. Yes. Good morning. So the LASD has been entrusted with a huge responsibility um, to enforce the law fairly to enhance trust and to manage the world's largest jail system. Your job here is the oversight for this enormous body is imperative. It is vital. And as a volunteer crisis responder, I can tell you um, the stories that are not making the like so many of atrocities that you have uh, witnessed and heard statements to this morning. There are stories like an individual uh, needing diapers, a grown man just in search of diapers. But while a person is in peril, um, the LSD shows up and arrests them. And so where is that individual today? What number? are they involved with in this enormous corrupt budget? It is time to prioritize alternatives to public safety and community-based systems of care. The funds that are currently allocated to support the presence of law enforcement in the hospitals, the traffic enforcement should immediately be reallocated. The funds should be directed towards alternatives to crisis response, formation of the Public Defender's Law Enforcement Accountability Unit to ensure the continued accountability and transparency of LASD and their remaining responsibilities. Stories like the one I just told you, lives that don't even have enough blood to care for them. These stories to end and you have the power to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the last public comment come from Adriana Quinones. Please go ahead with your comment, Adriana. Adriana Quinones, you are muted. Please go ahead with your comment. Okay. Um, not hearing anything. Leo, let's conclude public comment for this item. All right. Um, I at this point um, would like to um, turn to the search department and Mr. McBride's request um, to speak briefly on the um, on the budget um, that you had requested before public comment. So um, please go ahead for a few. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, first, I, I wanna thank you for allowing us to uh, participate in this. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge uh, the professional report that was presented by the CEO's office through Sheila Williams. Uh, it's a, uh, we, we concur with the majority of that and I think it's a reflection of the fact that we have been working together with the CEO's office to uh, come up with a product like that. You know, as you all know, this has been a very tough year in 2020, uh, starting at the very beginning of the year. Uh, the Sheriff's Department has had to contend with uh, a lot of unexpected events. Um, you know, the fires that have devastated some of our communities in the county, um, some of the civil unrest that has occurred all over the county of Los Angeles, where we have a number of independent cities who have called upon the sheriff's department to help protect their cities. 
uh, we've had to respond to that as well. Uh, we uh, are also in an election year and the uh, sheriff has been called upon to assist with the uh, security of the elections as well. So we have a number of, of costs that hit our budget. And, and, you know, anecdotally, when you look at a $3.5 billion budget, um, it, it's a lot of money, and, it's a, and we appreciate the fact that, you know, that's taxpayers' money. And, but when you break it down and you say the sheriff is responsible for $3.5 million or billion, excuse me, what you don't initially see is a lot of that money is revenue offset paid for by the contracts of, of agencies and cities that contract with the sheriff to provide security uh, and, and public safety. So, you know, there's 42 cities of the 88 in L.A. County that trust the sheriff's department to be their, their police department. And so that's revenue offset. And so that it's not a true picture. Like we, we concur with what Sheila Williams uh, acknowledged that, you know, over 90 percent of our budget is a salary that the sheriff has really no control over. And so um, we want to acknowledge the hard work that the CEO did in, in making this presentation, and we look forward to continue to work with them and with the COC to see what the best um, direction is to provide public safety for the residents in L.A. County. The, uh, I think there's, a, there's still a lot of issues. This is a dynamic uh, topic, um, and we're still in a dynamic environment. And we would welcome uh, the continued communication with the CEO's office and with the COC. And as we get some items resolved in this budget, it may be more appropriate to re-agendize re some of these, uh, th this topic and report back to the COC. I will tell you that we, we do have a number of sheriff subject matter experts um, that are participating today on this call, everything from our mental evaluation team to our custody division to our human resources to our budget team. And so there are a number of subject matter experts available, but given the fact that, that we are in weekly negotiations with the CEO to try to see what the best path is uh, moving forward to, for public safety, uh, I, I think we need to continue that positive communication with the CEO's office and maybe report back to the COC at a later date. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share this and speak uh, uh, on behalf of the men and women of the Sheriff's Department. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, that um, is frankly a breath of fresh air um, from the Sheriff's Department um, rather than attacking um, the CEO attacking this commission and um, we welcome and hope for um, continued participation on, um, on this issue and others as well. Um, as I indicated earlier at the beginning of the meeting, we have a lot on our uh, agenda and um, the budget is absolutely critical, but I'd like at this point to move to um, agenda item 2C which is a discussion regarding the Inspector General's analysis of the um, criminal investigation of the alleged assault by the banditos. Um, as you know, just for record keeping purposes, um, item 2B has been um, taken off the agenda um, that appears to be resolved um, without being agendized. So, um, I would um, like at this point to um, um, to turn the floor over to Mr. Huntsman, the Inspector General, and um, also we will, uh, following that, um, hear from Lieutenant Mark Lopez from the Sheriff's Department, um, talking about the Sheriff's response to um, the Inspector General's report. Please, uh, from the commissioners, please hold your comments until we hear from both speakers and then we'll proceed after that. So, Mr. Huntsman, the floor is yours. Madam Chair, before Mr. Huntsman. And then 
would like to have uh, the CEO or the Sheriff's Department uh, provide us with the total number of funded deputy sheriffs. I'd like to know how they're broken down in terms of numbers that are in patrol as opposed to custody, as opposed to um, other areas like uh, the courts. Uh, and I just would like to have that, if we could, before the next meeting, let's say within a couple of weeks, that's plenty of time. But I think that's an important uh, to really understand the budgets, to we really need to understand uh, that issue and how how deputies are deployed within the uh, within the department. But thank you. I just wanted to make that request. Thank you for that indulgence. Now we're back to uh, Mr. Huntsman. Thank you. And um, Mr. Williams, um, I think you can make that request. But I do want to go um, to uh, to Mr. Huntsman. So please go ahead. The floor is yours. As you all know, we did an analysis of the ICIB investigation of the Bandidos uh, alleged uh, assault at um, Kennedy Hall in the same manner that we investigated or analyzed uh, the rehiring of Karen Mandoyan. We I had my staff do a, a comprehensive look at all the materials that were submitted to the district attorney's office uh, and um, they came back and told me what their, their findings were. I asked them to provide a great deal of detail in there. So you'll find in that report pretty much all the excerpted uh, witness statements regarding the banditos because one of the points of the report is that this alleged um, motive for this incident, which is the banditos, uh, was not investigated thoroughly. Um, and as you've seen from the sheriff's response, they say, well, of course, because it's it's not relevant. Um, that's part of the report, but the most important part of the report is the absence of statements from 23 deputies. And so I want to talk for a moment. I want to show you a PowerPoint uh, that shows how uh, criminal cases are investigated. So I've, I've just shared with you the PowerPoint, so hopefully you can see it now. Um, this is how a criminal gang investigation, oh, I have to back up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go. This is how a criminal investigation works. Um, you have victims, witnesses, and suspects. As you can see, the victims and witnesses are green because usually they cooperate and talk to the police. It's not a problem. You gather evidence, you put it together, and you provide it to the DA. Uh, the suspects here are red because they have a First Amendment, a Fifth Amendment right not to speak, and so it's rare to get detailed statements. You can sometimes get statements, but for the most part, you can't compel them. In a criminal gang investigation, as you can see now, a number of the victims and witnesses are yellow, meaning they don't want to talk to the police. The reasons, as you can see below in these categories, are one is witness intimidation. Gangs have, a, have an intimidating effect even when they don't directly uh, it, reach out to witnesses, people are afraid of them. Um, and there's a code of silence, both between the gang members and in the community about not talking, again, and largely due to intimidation, but not exclusively. And then finally, as you can see under the red category, there's still the Fifth Amendment. So in a, in a gang investigation, you're not going to be able to compel statements from a gang member and use those to convict the gang member. That's the Fifth Amendment, just like anybody else, uh, they have those rights. In a criminal gang investigation, though, police are able to turn many of those yellow witnesses into green witnesses, and they do that through um, extensive questioning of all the witnesses and, and cross-categorizing what, pe what, what people tell them and going back and getting statements that they then can use and compelling statements as well. We have the ability to subpoena people as this board is seeking to subpoena the sheriff and to compel statements through the court process. When a person is subpoenaed, they don't have a choice about whether or not to talk unless they have a Fifth Amendment uh, right. And that's why you see the suspects here, even in the gang investigation, are still red. The Fifth Amendment prevents us from compelling them to testify against themselves. But the witnesses can be compelled to testify against the suspects. The victims can be compelled to testify against the suspect. And of course, there's also persuasion and, and the process of, of working with people. In a criminal deputy gang investigation, you've seen the same problems. Uh, you have victims and witnesses who are reluctant to come forward because they are afraid because of past retaliation we've seen within these organizations and because of a code of silence. In law enforcement, it is generally not frowned upon for law enforcement officers to say bad things about their partners or about their fellow officers. And in LSD in particular, that's a very strong uh, impetus within these secret societies. They're secret for a reason, to protect the members. And so we've seen repeatedly members of these societies refusing to speak even under oath or saying things that, that might possibly be false and perjurious that need to be investigated. Still, the targets of the investigation have a Fifth Amendment right and you cannot compel them. 
However, the Sheriff's Department does have the ability to compel uh, the members of the, of the organization who are not the suspects. And here you can see their actual policy. It's mentioned in my report, but I wanted you to have the actual language because it specifically provides that it's the policy of the Sheriff's Department that the members shall provide statements in criminal investigations unless they have a Fifth Amendment right. So in, in these internal sheriff's criminal investigations, all of the witnesses who are deputies should be turned into green witnesses, but through the means of their requirement under this policy to, uh, to speak. Uh, and in fact, the sheriff's department has um, prepared a form for that. And I yeah, this was provided to me by the sheriff's department. And it, it's a form that they pre pre prepared years ago when this was a prior problem in which they lay out to the witnesses, look, if you have a fifth man right, don't tell us anything. But if you're if you're not, if you didn't have anything to do with this, then you got to talk. You don't have a choice. And so they have a, a process for actually compelling them and it was and and a routine for it. But in practice, when it comes to secret societies, this piece of paper was not used. Uh, the, the policy that I just described was not uh, followed. And as a result, in the Bandidos investigation, 23 people, and I'm leaving out the suspects, because again, you cannot compel suspects and then use what they say against them. That, that, those statements were never obtained, and so they were never given to the DA's office, and the uh, decision not to file was based upon less than complete evidence. And then the Sheriff's Department went and did an internal affairs investigation where they compelled statements from the targets. So now if a, a, a prosecuting agency uh, attempts to go back and prosecute, they're going to have to work around those compelled statements and proved that they never used those in the criminal investigation. So in addition to, to not compelling people in the criminal case, the Sheriff's Department has now done the thing which can complicate a criminal case, which is to compel statements from the suspects, um, as opposed to compelling them from the witnesses, which will not complicate a case. So that's basically it in a nutshell. But if you want to look at the detailed report, you can find it on uh, on my website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Hunt. I have a question, Lyle. Um, yeah, I mean, let's, I, as I said initially, I want to hear from um, Lieutenant Lopez first, and then we'll open this up. Uh, Lieutenant Lopez, did you have something in terms of the sheriff's response to uh, Mr. Huntsman's report. Yes, I do, Ms. Leal. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, allowing me the opportunity to participate in this, uh, in this meeting. Uh, I'm the Special Projects Lieutenant at the Audit and Accountability Bureau for the Sheriff's Department, and the sheriff has requested that I read his response to the OIG's analysis of the Bandido investigation report. And although I will not be answering any questions today, I will continue to monitor the meeting to capture any questions the uh, commission may have and take them back to the department. So the sheriff's uh, response letter to the uh, Office of the Inspector General is dated October 8th. And it's addressed to uh, Mr. Huntsman on the OIG analysis of the criminal investigation of alleged assault by banditos. This letter is in response to the October 2020 analysis report your office published on the criminal investigation into the Kennedy Hall incident on September 28, 2018, conducted by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, LASD, Internal Criminal Investigation Bureau, ICID investigators. It is extremely troubling that your office alleges ICIB investigators did not conduct a thorough investigation into the incident. Your report failed to document that the LESD conducted a criminal and administrative investigation where investigators interviewed over 70 involved parties and witnesses in this case. As you should already know, ICIB investigators conduct criminal investigations and not administrative investigations. In order to preserve the integrity of a criminal investigation, the investigators do not compel statements. Your report alludes that ICIB investigators purposely did not ask questions or tried to cover up criminal activity. The criminal investigation conducted by the LESD was subsequently presented to the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office Justice System Integrity Division 
by ICIB investigators for their review. On February 6, 2020, the district attorney's office declined to prosecute the case and provided a 28 page declination report indicating there was insufficient, insufficient evidence for a filing. When I first took office, I relieved the East Los Angeles station captain of his command, overhauled the entire leadership of the station, and transferred 36 personnel because of this incident. Unlike previous administrations, I became the first sheriff to successfully implement a policy specifically addressing employee groups, which violate the rights of other employees or members of the public. The administrative investigation was completed in approximately 100 days, despite the pandemic, civil unrest, wildfires, and budgetary restraints. In my commitment to transparency, I held a press conference with the public on August 13, 2020, to discuss the results of the completed investigation. 26 deputies in this incident were either suspended or terminated. I welcome oversight to bring balance and meaningful dialogue to the best interest of the public we serve. It is unfortunate you continue to omit facts and bring false narratives in support of your political agenda. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact my Chief of Staff, Captain George A. Valdez at 213-229-3001. Sincerely, Sheriff Alex Villanueva. Um, thank you, um, Mr. McBride, for that. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, Mr. Lopez, Lieutenant Lopez. Um, it is um, frankly not helpful that you're here to read a letter that um, we received from the Sheriff's Department and in the same time um, say um, you're here not to answer any questions, um, but to take questions back to the Sheriff. And maybe that underscores the, the real need to have the Sheriff present at our meetings. But um, be that as it may, I understand you have marching orders um, I thank you for being here, but I certainly wish, and I'm sure the rest of the commissioners wish that um, we could have a dialogue where you could answer some questions that are raised. Um, with that, um, I'll start with Commissioner Bonner. Yes, well, first of all, I agree with uh, the chair. Have a letter read to us, which I had read last night, uh, but thank you, uh, Lieutenant Lopez. Um, it's not just disappointing not to have the sheriff here, but uh, uh, I, I'm going to uh, move that we subpoena the sheriff to our next meeting. Not a person most knowledgeable, the sheriff himself. I want to hear from the sheriff. I want to hear what the sheriff actually has done with respect to the banditos at East LA Station. I want to hear from the sheriff as to what he's done to enforce his policy prohibiting uh, membership in deputy cliques or deputy gangs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and I'd like to have the commission vote on that subpoena momentarily. Let me make a couple of other comments. Uh, and then I have a question for Mr. Huntsman, but uh, I think Mr. Huntsman, uh, the IG has certainly made the case that the uh, ICIB investigation was not a thorough investigation, that they could have used and compelled statements from witnesses he did not do so. But the sheriff, to the extent that he contradicts Mr. Huntsman on that point in his letter of October 8 is wrong. This was not a thorough investigation. ICIB could have compelled statements from witnesses. It did not do so. And also, it's pretty clear from reading the IG's report that uh, the ICIB certainly did not probe deeply or really at all. They skirted around the issue of the banditos and the role of the banditos in terms of the uh, the assaults that took place at the Kennedy Hall. In fact, it was like a huge elephant in the room that was ignored studiously by the uh, ICIB. Uh, let's not talk about that. Well, that's what it should be. You know, a thorough investigation, you really had to get into the issue of the existence of the banditos, who belonged to the banditos, and uh, how that played into that investigation. So it wasn't done. So the IG has definitely made his case. 
But uh, I note in the letter, uh, my third uh, item here is in the sheriff's letter of October 8th, he does refer to after the ICIB investigation, there was an administrative investigation. And I just wanted to ask Mr. Huntsman, first of all, uh, have you had access to that administrative investigation? And at the report, and to what extent that it Banditos, the existence of the Banditos, the membership in the Banditos, the influence of the Banditos at the East LA station, uh, etc. Um, Mr. Huntsman? The, there has been an administrative investigation conducted subsequently. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, uh, as with all, all of their investigations of late, did not allow us to monitor it. Uh, as they did not allow us to monitor the ICFB investigation, but once it was complete, they made available to us the records. So, um, so we have them. We obtained them about the time that we were uh, putting this report, the finishing touches on it, and I instructed my staff not to review it at that time because of the presence of compelled statements. And I did not want to have anything in my report here and at, at all possibly influenced by the compelled statements of suspects. Uh, not of witnesses, I would love that to be the case, but of the suspects, uh, because it is possible that the district attorney's office may revisit uh, their decision. They could, if they chose to, uh, compel statements from those witnesses and have a thorough um, case before them to decide whether or not to file. And I didn't want to make their job harder under Castigar and the other cases that uh, prohibit the use of, of that. So if the, as of now, I've instructed my staff not to review it. We will in the future um, do that, but I wanted to give an opportunity to the appropriate uh, prosecutorial agencies to move forward unfettered if they chose. Yes. Well, here's, okay, I understand your answer. You haven't reviewed it. Uh, uh, we would like to review it. We have an ad hoc committee that is dealing with deputy cliques. I, I would very much like to have the administrative uh, investigation uh, to be reviewed. And so I'm going to request it. And I'm going to request it, I suppose, of the sheriff's department that we be provided that. I hopefully don't have to subpoena it from the sheriff's department, but I would like that to be provided to the COC so that it can be reviewed by the ad hoc committee that's uh, looking into the issue of deputy cliques or deputy gangs. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Patty? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a question, Mr. Huntsman. Uh, is it standard and accepted practice for inspectors general to, as part of their mandates, uh, to monitor investigations of these kinds and, um, what were the reasons were you given for uh, not being allowed to, if indeed um, that is part of your charge? Um, inspectors general are a, a new phenomenon in law enforcement, relatively new, not brand new, but relatively new. They have existed for a very long time in the federal government in particular and in other governments in which they monitor active processes. And there it has um, been a grant of authority to, to do just that, to monitor directly uh, during a process, and that's in order to give uh, more confidence to the public and government. But they've also been the source of attack from government because of that. Uh, at the federal level, um, a number of inspectors general have been fired uh, under the current administration over um, unhappiness with the things that they've um, learned as a result of their process, is my take on it as an inspector general. Um, but I suppose somebody else would have a different take. In California specifically, uh, the government code provides for the uh, uh, supervisors to supervise the county officers, including the sheriff. And in uh, the county of Los Angeles, that has been implemented by an ordinance um, that is the sister ordinance to uh, the, this commission's ordinance that requires all county employees to cooperate with the inspector general and provide information um, on an ongoing basis. And that includes during active investigations. The only limit uh, is that the the government code says we can't interfere, but we're allowed to monitor. And very recently, uh, the, the um, legislature passed an amendment to that section or a follow-up section that makes it absolutely clear that the monitoring, uh, the investigation even uh, by an inspector general, by its by definition does not interfere with a criminal and, or um, any other investigation that's active. So by law, I believe it is already clear that we have the right to do that and the sheriff is not following it. 
I, I believe by the amended law that goes into effect January 1st, it is even clearer if, it, if that's possible. And then ultimately, um, I think there's a, an issue of, um, I've, uh, I will ask the board to uh, ratify essentially to, to um, say that our uh, office and your uh, commission are created under that code section to give us the expanded powers of that code section, which expand subpoena power to insist and to use legal process. Um, I didn't address that in my slide presentation, but there's been some discussion during the DA race about whether or not you can subpoena witnesses and, and require them to testify. Well, you're currently engaged in a legal battle with the sheriff to find out whether or not you can do it. I guarantee you in criminal cases, you absolutely can, and it's been done for hundreds, uh, 100 plus years. In, um, in this instance, I believe this commission can as well. Uh, one more, one more follow-up. Um... Max, if you will, when was the last time that you and your team were allowed to monitor a process as opposed to teacher. coming? I'm sorry, you muted because of the background noise, and now we okay. can't hear you. <laughs> Redacted. Uh, when, was the last, when was the last time you were allowed to monitor and uh, a process? Um, uh, as opposed to coming in at the end and given redacted materials, et cetera. There's two instances in which I'd say we've been allowed to monitor. One, one is we still continue to receive walkthroughs upon uh, deputy involved shootings. Uh, the, the sheriff's department allows us to come look at the scene and gives us the briefing they give to the other parties involved. And after that, they shut us down. Um, the other uh, exception is uh, the Kobe Bryant uh, um, allegations of cover-up. When we conduct uh, sub, sub, uh, advised them that we wanted information for our investigation, they the sheriff sent a letter asking us to quote monitor that investigation. But it turned out what he meant by that was to periodically have my staff sit in a room, be shown redacted reports, and not allowed to take them with them to examine them. So it's a process that I don't consider monitoring, and is certainly not in compliance with state law or or ordinance. That's it with anything that goes up to the um, management level. We do have a good working relationship with a lot of local stations and with uh, working custody where we're the monitor on a, a federal, essentially a settlement like a consent decree. Um, and so they wouldn't really be able to completely shut us down. And the folks there are a little more cooperative. Not that they let us monitor investigations very directly, but they they share information with us. They're much more open in some of those places. But that's that's not by decree of uh, the administration. Um, um, Priscilla, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so you know your your report um, just sort of underscores. Uh, the troubling aspects or the, 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 the troubling nature of these gangs that um, uh, seem to not only ex exist uh, uh, in ways that are prevalent throughout the department, but also seem to be protected uh, based on the, the report that you've given, Max. So, um, you know, the sheriff argues that you are, are understating the investigation. He says you didn't acknowledge that they interviewed 70 people. You do. Um, the problem is they didn't ask those, according to your findings, they didn't ask those those uh, witnesses um, questions that would get to the core of the matter, which is not only the incident that occurred, but also um, the way in which the banditos are operating in this particular substation and the way in which these gangs are operating in, in other substations. We have real concerns that the kind of violence uh, that these uh, gangs perpetuate um, is it limited to other deputies, although that by itself is is outrageous, um, that it has effects on the community. The commu there have been allegations that the Andres Gardardo shooting was related to a deputy gang. Um, uh, Commissioner Kennedy's um, uh, 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 research has found that there's a relationship or at least there's some correlation between those substations where there are deputy gangs and uh, um, uh, uh, allegations of, of misconduct and abuse and uh, um, excessive use of force. So this, the idea that the sheriff um, uh, and it, through its investigations are intentionally um, taking a hands-off approach or intentionally um, asking questions that are designed not to get to the core of the problem is outrageous. And, and I think it, 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 really under, it really underscores the need for us to have independent investigations of um, allegations of criminal wrongdoing or allegations of uh, constitutional violations by the, 
uh, members of the sheriff's department. And I don't think we can really rest until we get that kind of um, thorough independent investigation. And I, I second uh, Commissioner Bonner's call for a subpoena of those records related to the investigation of the banditos um, and the quality of that investigation, which I think we will find um, uh, is lacking. So um, again, I think we need to keep uh, our foot on the gas on this, and I appreciate uh, the work that the OIG has done on this on this issue. Thank you. Um, yes, Sean. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a question. I get, I don't know that it can be answered. Maybe Max can answer it. Um, we hear so much about East LA Station. It's an incubator of gangs or cliques since the 70s. Um, there's non-cooperation with the Inspector General, uh, and as he knows, with anyone investigating the banditos. It's the site of the controversial Fort Apache logo. And my own review of the past years, the immediate past years of shootings, shows that it is by far the number one station for deputy shootings. In light of that, do we know why East LA is not on the list of the first stations to get body-worn cameras? And for our Inspector General, would body-worn cameras in problematic state uh, uh, with investigations of these matters? Because uh, Priscilla Ochen is right. When you look at the stations with known active deputy gangs, and you review the number of shootings in the past five years, there is a correlation between those two things. The top five stations are all stations that we hear about in the press all the time with active deputy cliques or gangs. So why are the body-worn cameras not going there? You know, that's a great question. Um, Matt? Yeah, I can answer some of it, not all of it, obviously. Um, the decision of where to send the body cameras was essentially a law enforcement LASD decision. It was made, I think, primarily based upon a desire to include all, all uh, supervisor areas because the supervisors were putting out the, the money for the body one cameras, and so they would all want to make sure that their um, constituents were were served. Uh, also, with the understanding that it's a it's a essentially a role um, a pilot program. I know it's a huge one, but as you just heard, it's only 5,000 cameras that are currently budgeted. We need quite a few more because everybody should have a body one camera. Every uh, protest should have body one cameras. Every uh, special operation by by a unit going to arrest somebody should have body one cameras, not just some of these. But to answer your question about, well, why the heck didn't they target um, a, a central location for uh, deputy secret societies? Uh, the, I believe the answer is because the sheriff's department has not uh, made a serious effort to attempt to get rid of deputy uh, societies for 50 years. So it's uh, the sheriff often complains that he's being blamed for um, you know stuff that his predecessors uh, did just as well. Uh, I mean that's true. The, he's not the first guy who hasn't solved this problem. Um, under the previous administration, I, I brought up these issues regarding compelling witnesses in deputy gang cases as well, and this, the previous administration didn't do it either, and I, I complained bitterly about secret societies publicly and privately, which triggered the, the whole process of the RAND report, which has been slow, but I'm hoping will result in something that is helpful to the county in litigating some of these issues, because you mentioned the um, the little devils back um, back in that area in the 70s. In that case, the, the department was able very quickly to identify everybody in in the the alleged gang, get get their tattoos, get statements from them about what was happening. I mean, it it was very uh, effective in investigating because it was new, and I think they were offended. And now, 50 years later, it's accepted. So I think the answer is nobody looked at body cameras as a means of doing anything about secret societies. It was never the intent. And But I agree 100% with the implication of your question that it should be. Um, body one cameras will be critical because the sheriff's department will admit that bad conduct is bad. They say, well, we're not going to investigate secret societies because we're only going to investigate if they do something bad. And then as we're seeing in this instance, when they do something bad, they leave the secret society part out. Well, if you get body worn cameras on folks and you can actually do a better job of monitoring what conduct is engaged in, that will be a huge help 
uh, for both internal work and external work. And secondarily, uh, we should have dash cams. We should have that across the board and certainly targeting areas with secret uh, societies is, is an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ochen. You're, you're muted. I'm sorry, this, is, this is Commissioner Harris. It's my turn. So oh, Commissioner Ochen recognized her being unmuted. Um, I'll go to Commissioner Harris. So, so um, my question is to um, Mr. Huntsman. So the, the sheriff says that, you know, he's taken decisive action with regard to the East LA station, reassigning uh, leadership. Um, and with regard to this investigation, uh, terminating or suspending 23 deputies. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about one, uh, the validity of, of that claim, um, and two, um, do you know how many of those 23 deputies were either a terminated and how many were suspended um, and then reinstated? Uh, and then lastly, is that effective? The use of uh, suspension, termination, reassignment, has that been effective in, in dealing with the issue of um, deputy gangs at the East LA station or, or elsewhere? Well, the initial claim, there was a, a PR kind of claim made that what well, we've taken care of it, we transferred X number of, of uh, people out. Uh, that His own staff very quickly said that number was not accurate. It wasn't a reflection of banditos who were transferred out. It's just all the transfers they've done in that station since whatever time it was he declared. I uh, have not heard at all um, a number raised by the Sheriff's Department of how many banditos they have transferred out for being banditos. I think the answer is zero. Um, how many people who we might think our banditos might be a larger number, but because no investigation has been conducted to identify the banditos, I don't think the sheriff department knows for sure, although it might have some guess. And then ultimately, I think I, I've heard, heard um, I would say I have confidential sources that I think are pretty reliable that people are still being inked in East Los Angeles. So the idea that the banditos are gone from East LA, I think is highly, highly suspect, uh, both because the same reason I don't believe in saucers from, from other planets, you know, what's the mechanism? What do we really see little green men flying around? What's the mechanism that would have stopped this? And I see nothing that's been done. Um, then, then, then you look at the question of, okay, who did he discipline? The sheriff made a, um, a public statement that he disciplined 26 people. I think it was not 23. 23 is the number from my report of how many uh, witnesses leaving out the suspects who weren't uh, forced to give statements. But there were 26, according to him, um, disciplines uh, that imposed, including firings. To my knowledge, nobody's been fired. I think it, uh, there may have been some letters sent out to tell people that they might be fired. But as we've talked about in reports previously, there's an extensive process, uh, including a, a number of steps at which the department has historically walked back um, statements that they're going to fire somebody through a settlement process uh, in, in terms of the, the employee's rights that then they say, oh, never mind, we'll give you a few days off. So I haven't seen any firings yet. And a substantial number of the, that 26, if I understand, are the victims. The people who were assaulted, apparently, by the banditos were also being uh, disciplined. It, I have heard, I don't know this for a fact, and that that's for failing to report the fact to the banditos, the fact that the banditos beat them up. In other words, they should have gone to their uh, um, staff inside the, the station and said we were we were attacked, and they, apparently they didn't do that quick enough. Um, and likewise, I think a number of witnesses um, have allegedly been disciplined for not reporting fast enough or in an appropriate way. Again, I'm not aware of anybody who got disciplined as a result of being a bandito. Uh, the sheriff uh, has, has said publicly, and I think other members of his staff have said, we don't believe we can enforce this policy that we've said about how we can't have secret societies, so we're not disciplining anybody under, under it, which um, I, I don't understand that, uh, but I do understand how they might not have <laughs> some factual information. But as I said, I've not, I haven't examined the internal affairs investigation yet to find out what they have actually learned when they conducted that process because of my concerns re regarding the criminal one. So I don't think the transfers have been effective at, at changing the dynamic in East LA. At least there's no reason to believe they have. There's no investigation that's been conducted to find out, so I don't know. And then the the idea that we've somehow um, you know conducted significant discipline that addresses the problem, uh, I, I'm not aware of any reason to believe that. But again, uh, the, this, the disciplinary process is an ongoing one that, ha that has a number of steps. So until it's all done, you never know for sure. But it's kind of like 
the the Kobe Bryant uh, cover up investigation. You know, we pointed out that it appeared to be a problem with management. Um, they did an, initially an investigation regarding non-management, and eventually they told us, well, we're going to expand to management. I think they announced it publicly. And they also were going to announce the results. And now nothing's ever been heard of that again. We're not allowed to monitor, and there's been no you know, report on whether or not the sheriff finds he committed misconduct. So I think the same kind of problem exists here. We have an announcement that, yes, the problem's been solved, but no ability to monitor to confirm that it's true. And when a person tells you, I'm holding five aces in my hand, but you can't look, I'm skeptical. So, so I just want to summarize what I've heard. So we have uh, a history going back almost six um, uh, decades of deputy gangs uh, uh, in various substations um, uh, and custody environments in the sheriff's department, yet nobody knows who these people are um, in, in the leadership of the sheriff's department. Um, no one is able to identify um, who these folks are, despite the fact that, as, Sheriff, as, as Sean said, um, we have a record of increased numbers of shootings, uh, excessive use of force, in the substations where uh, deputy gangs are alleged to exist. When there are investigations, those investigations are cursory. Um, they are not transparent and they don't include independent oversight. Um, and then when there are supposed uh, disciplinary measures, those disciplinary measures are not uh, capable of being really monitored. Um, and to the extent that they are, um, what we understand to have been imposed on folks who have participated uh, in uh, some activity related to deputy gangs is retaliation against the victims um, and light penalty for the perpetrators. So it seems to me that the department's policy is basically don't ask, don't tell, um, and don't do anything. Um, and that is despicable, it's disgraceful, um, and it is uh, an insult to the residents um, of LA County, but especially to residents of, of, uh, that are particularly vulnerable in East LA, Compton, and, and elsewhere. Well, I just wanna add, I agree with everything you said, but there's one caveat, which is the secrecy of these groups is primarily the on the record secrecy. You can't say in a deposition that you're a member and that you, these are the other 10 members. You can't have it written down in, in a report um, because that would allow action to be taken. But people know, a lot of people know and people suspect, and that's how the intimidation factor functions. For instance, Karen Mandoyan, we learned because of the process of rehiring, was a grim reaper and used that status uh, to intimidate the victim in the case that got him fired in the first place. And that's on tape and, uh, you know, and part of part of that whole process. And we've reported on it. So there are instances where there is knowledge of who is. Um, I'm aware of an instance where a person was promoted apparently to a coveted position who is believed to have been a bandito post all this process. So there are people whose careers have certainly not suffered and maybe even benefited. Previously, a Viking uh, was the number two in the office. And there's reason to believe under the current administration, there were some folks who who may May also have been members of groups and and I think the folks there know darn well who who is who they just don't put it on paper because then somebody else might say uh, excuse me well, that's what okay. I mean. it, it's a, it's an open secret it's yeah. it, I'm saying it facetiously that nobody knows who these people yeah. are that do right um, yes they look the other way. it seems to me that um you ought to know the identity of the 26 people who have been allegedly fired or terminated. And I think the commission ought to know. Um, Max, can you respond to that? Yes, I agree. That, um, in uh, June of last year, we submitted the uh, draft version of the Mandoyan report uh, to the Sheriff's Department. And a few days later, later our computer terminals were turned off which used to allow us to look at disciplinary information. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, had, as they have sent a letter and explained, they still let us come and look at stuff under their watchful eye, under certain controlled circumstances, which has resulted in warnings to us regarding COVID and whatnot. Uh, but they have absolutely flat out refused to turn back on our computers and let us do that. If, if they were on, we could run them in five minutes and do that. I, like I say, I haven't taken those steps yet in this case because of the Castigar compelled statement issue. But uh, barring that, and at some point now that the report's out, you know, the, the the powers that be can react to it or not if they choose, and that won't be a problem. I've just been waiting a little bit to give it a chance to settle in. But we should be able to run. We should be able to send somebody down, and that they would let us do. But they also should comply with state law and our ordinance and turn back on those terminals so that we can do our job. And this, this body also ought to, ought to have access to that 
kind of information when it's permissible under the law. I agree. Um, yes. um, JP, you had you had been waiting patiently to weigh in here. Thank you very much and indulge me because I do have a number of questions. Many of the commissioners have hit upon some of the questions I have. Um, but Max, you just brought up the issue of the fact that they have shut down your access um, to the databases of the Sheriff's Department. Um, do we have any legal basis to go to court to compel the Sheriff's Department to allow you that access once again? That's quite yes. good. You'd answer that. I appreciate it. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's a simple answer, but are there a lot of statutes to cover? Yeah, the sheriff isn't following the law, and the the court uh, and the the county can can sue for a writ to order him to follow the law. As you as you know from having tried to enforce the law on the sheriff uh, just recently, uh, it's it's hard as all heck, right? There, there's already a law that says he's supposed to come here or have one of his executive staff, and he doesn't come, and that hasn't been enforced. That's even before you ever issued a subpoena to him. We used to have the an assistant sheriff who would came, come and say Max was lying when he said I'm not being given information. And then in January, I presented you the PowerPoint with the documents proving that we had asked for information, not been giving it, included Mr. McBride, who addressed you today on, on hiring practices. And then they stopped coming. Um, so, so we've already got failures to follow the law before you ever got around to triggering a subpoena process, which, which the litigation is slow. There's a couple of other mechanisms in place now. There's, there's um, the county council has asked us to assist them with gathering information regarding another claim. So I'm hopeful that that litigation process will result in some court orders. Um, come January 1st, we'll have a new law that I think will strengthen our hand. But could we? In theory, today, I have county council file a suit. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a Times art editorial about this that hit electronically. I don't know that it's in the paper that points out there's a 3060 action under the government code. If the sheriff won't do his job, then the AG and the, the grand jury and, and us asking for it can throw him out of office. So are there mechanisms for that? Yeah, but in these COVID times especially, and even outside of COVID time, that legal process is so incredibly slow that that uh, I think, you know, county council, if you ask them and they weren't being, you know, careful as lawyers to be, to be um, uh, thoughtful and how they present it would say, the ability to do that, the practical ability is limited. The legal ability, is it there? Yes. All right. um, Hang on, I got a lot more questions. I'm not ready to concede my time yet. So if you don't mind, may I proceed? All right. How much time are you talking about? Well, I've probably got another five to 15 minutes. Depends on how long uh, Max's answers are. Let's put it that way. My questions aren't that long, but I'm going to do better. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I've, got another, I've got another five, right. uh, five minutes, JP, because we really need to take a break. Well, and I understand that, but I've been trying to get on here for almost half an hour, so I appreciate that. And some commissioners have already spoken multiple times, so I'm going to go ahead and go ahead. Um, I guess I'm going to ask the question, Max, would it be quicker if this commission had private counsel? No. Okay, that's fine. Move on from there. Um, the uh, issue of your having the ability to review the internal affairs investigation to the same degree you were granted access to the ICID investigation. Are, are we, can we expect to see that type of a review also? Because that's what I want. I want to know what they did in the internal affairs investigation because they can compel statements there. I understand we don't want to groove up a criminal prosecution, but I think the reality is if we had deputies who invoked the fifth and, talk, and not talking to ICIB, they could do the same thing in IAB, but of course then they're subject to termination. And so if they do talk now, yes, they can't be uh, criminally prosecuted, but they sure can be fired. I guess where I'm really going with this is I would like to know, did the internal affairs investigation go into this gang membership because they could compel statements? We said, and they said, you know, I, ICIB had a bunch of people who they did not compel statements from, which they should have. I totally get it. 
Well, I want to know now, well, did you now compel them in the IAB setting? And if not, that's a massive mistake on the Sheriff's Department's part, but I don't know that until you can provide us with a review of that internal affairs investigation. At a point now where you're working on that and we should have a, a report on that, expect a report on that soon? No, as I've said, I'm not working on it yet because I do not want to create a Castigar problem for a potential prosecution. However, I will in the future do it. But I can answer your question. Did they compel statements? Yes, they did. When, when I um, actually do a review of the, of the process, I will be able to report to you in summary. I'll give, be able to give you a page or two to say thumbs up or thumbs down, in my opinion. I will not be able to give you the detail I gave you in the ICIB case. The reason we can give you that detail is because under 832.7 of the Penal Code, the ICIB uh, case is uh, an instance in which there was a use of force that resulted in great bodily injury. Mm -hmm. that, may, that may allow us to give you all the details on the IA case, and it may allow you even to subpoena the IA case because it's, it may not be confidential under um, 832.7, but I haven't done that analysis yet. I did that only as to the criminal case. Okay, well, because I would certainly, I, I don't need to know the names, but I would certainly uh, would like to know of those three deputies and sergeant who that was identified in ICIB as being potential criminal targets. I would like to know what the outcome was for them. Would they was he fired or disciplined? You know, I, I, but I want to know, are those people who are uh, in this uh, in activity at Kennedy Hall, what happened to them? And then hopefully those other 23 or so that were just there, we'd like to know, well, tell us what type of discipline they received. I don't need to know names and anything else, but I'd like to get a general feel for was there some appropriate discipline dispensed um, or not. Um, is there any way we can know? Because I know that statement uh, that the sheriff made about how he went into East LA, got rid of the captain and transferred 36 people. I share your incredulity on that. I, have, I too have heard that, yeah, there were 36 transfers, but not that they were the direct result of any action by the sheriff. Is there any way we can know when someone is transferred, is there any way to know if that was a volitional transfer or if that was a forced or a transfer, uh, you know, forced upon them by management? Yes, if my um, terminals were turned back on, I would be able to figure that out in some instances. Okay. For instance, I'm aware that the Sheriff's Department received an anonymous um, complaint regarding the banditos a few months before the Kennedy Hall incident, and they began a process of looking at it. That ultimately did result in some transfer type action, and I believe, although I have not look for this because of the current current difficult process to to try to do this kind of work um if we had the terminals up i could figure out by looking at the the investigation whether or not that triggered the transfer so there, there is some ability to do what you're doing and give you like a report card like i say i can't give you details regarding peace officer personnel records as you know in many instances but i can tell you i can give you a clean bill of health or a not a bill of health i don't do that a lot because you know, I don't want to just generate letters like we got from the sheriff saying Max is lying. Um, right. So instead, I did it in the ICIB case because we were able to put the evidence on the table. The policy that I that I mentioned is on the Internet. Everybody can see that it actually is the policy of the sheriff's department to compel mm -hmm. statements. And when they say it isn't, that's not what's written down. You know, so so it's we don't usually have that ability. So if I do do that, um, you know, the sheriff's going to send you a letter saying, well, he doesn't have it right. Okay. Well, I do note that many of those transfers of those 36, he's saying that that happened, you know, because of the Kennedy Hall incident. And I note that the Kennedy Hall incident happened three days before October in 2018. And he was elected sheriff in uh, December of 2017 and sworn in. And those transfers, I believe, took place shortly thereafter. So this illusion that uh, all these transfers took place because of the Kennedy Hall situation. I, I have some deep skepticism that that statement may not be totally true. You're being polite. Thank you. Um, I, I'll let it go for, for now, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Rubens. So thank you very much. Thank you. And um, at this point, no, no, just a second, Priscilla. At this point, we need to, um, I, I want to take a 15 minute break. We'll come back to your question and then we'll do um, 
the rest of the public comment on one minute each, but I, I will get back to you, I promise. So um, we are now taking a 15 minute break and we will resume in 15 minutes. Thank you. So I'm just going to mute some folks and we'll reach 1150.
Excellent. And I see that some people are returning for all of the commissioners and speakers. If you could just go ahead and turn your video on so that we can confirm that everyone is seated um, and we'll get started in about three minutes. So please turn your video on if you are back in front of your computer. Okay, and again, if um, we have commissioners who are in front of your computer, please go ahead and turn your video on just so we can confirm that you are back. We are going to get started in about a minute. Okay, and it is 1150 Lael, so you can go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, I um, had cut off Priscilla Ochen, um, who wanted to ask a question when we took the break. So Priscilla, if you want to go ahead briefly. Are you there? Um, I don't think she's back. Oh, well, she was originally, but um, all right, then uh, what I'm going to do then is um, um, proceed to public comment and then um, if she did have anything that she needed to um, raise, we could do that afterwards. And um, Jennifer, because, oh, there, there you are. Because of the time frame, um, uh, I want to have public comment one minute each. Um, Priscilla, did you want to? Um, did you have a question you wanted to raise at this point? Yeah, I just had a question for the sheriff's department um, representatives. Either they can answer it or take it back to uh, Sheriff Inueva. But I'm wondering if they would be willing to make a commitment um, to or or to to answer the question as to first. The, my question is why uh, was Mr. Huntsman's access to uh, the terminal that enables him to monitor disciplinary proceedings? Why was why was that suspended? Um, and then my 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 question, my second question is: Would, would the sheriff's department be willing to commit uh, to reinstating the OIG's access um, to that information? And this is Jennifer. I just want to chime in. There were some personnel from SD that were on a phone line and it looks like that phone line is no longer on the system. So I'm not sure if any of the other individuals who have logged in um, as panelists have anything to say or if there are any attendees who sheriff's personnel who would like to respond, please send me uh, a message. Uh, Lieutenant Lopez was the one who, um, you know, had, um, had responded on this issue. I don't know if he's still on Oh, there you are. Go ahead, sir. 
Yes, I am sorry, and I apologize about my camera earlier. Apparently, uh, it did not turn on. My apologies, but I have uh, heard your questions, Ms. Osan, and I will take those back to the department. Um, is there anything else that you can say at this point to make better use of your presence? That's all I'm prepared to say at this point. All right. Um, in that respect, let's proceed to uh, one minute each of public comment, Jennifer. Okay, um, and just as a reminder to the attendees, if you've signed up for public comment, please be sure that your hand raised in the participant window. It seems some of the pre registration is not coming through on the report. So uh, please make sure that your hand is raised. But the first comment will come from Julie Martinez. Julie, please go ahead with your comment. Uh, yes, I want to make a comment about the deputy. First off, please utilize the language of gangs, not click. This is more serious than a click. I also want to, with a limited time, I'm just going to reference what the attorney for the sheriff department presented two meetings ago, two months ago. He claimed that he was not concerned with the Nazi symbolism and the home homage paid to the Nazi party by the executioners. He stated that he wasn't concerned with images. He was concerned with behaviors. The community member, two community members have reported that a sergeant in the sheriff department not only demonstrated how to, to do a Nazi symbol, encouraged members of the community to utilize the Nazi symbol. And this particular sergeant was wearing, was on duty and wearing uh, LA County Sheriff Department. So the attorney for the Sheriff Department should be concerned because this is an exact example of the utilization, not just paying homage, but actually acting Thank it out you. in the community. Thank you. Thank you. And before we move on to the next comment, uh, an announcement in Spanish. Necesita traducir sus comentarios en español. Por favor, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de comentar sus comentarios y alguien traducirá sus comentarios cuando termine. Gracias. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Alex Cave. Alex, please go ahead with your comment. Thank you so much. Um, the fact that you brought up that the areas with the most officer involved shootings don't have body cameras is frankly horrifying. Um, and the fact that LASD made that decision is very telling. Um, that should be the number one budget priority for all officers, especially when you have qualified immunity, when you have the DA not prosecuting police officers, it's very concerning. Um, and a whistleblower is the one who shared the information that the murder of Andres Guadardo was, in fact, an initiation. East LA organizers have known about these gangs uh, for years. They're very aware of it. People even suspect Alex Villanueva who, to have come from that since he came from East LA. Um, the culture is like a gang also with them being fully loaded with weapons. I watched them laugh at the vigil for Andres Guadardo. They laughed at Dijon Kizzi's family when he was killed. Alex Villanueva encourages it with his immature and childish attitude, the way he speaks to you, the way he speaks to the Board of Supervisors. We need transparency. We need oversight, information to the public, and to stop this culture of violence that they have brought upon us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Leah Garcia. Please go ahead with your comment, Leah. Um, hi, my son Paul Rea was murdered on June 27th of 2019. And I have watched this department um, harass me and my family um, terribly. And why being never doesn't say anything um, too much about the clique or the gang, whatever it's called, is because what I have heard from family members um, about Villanueva, was all part of it. That's why he, doesn't, he wants to keep it hush hush because he was part of this. He, he was um, terrorizing the community when he was on patrol and, and he's no better than and anybody of the gang, actually. Um, that's why he doesn't speak much about it because I feel strongly that he is part of it. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Gina Viola. Please go ahead with your comment. Family members of those killed by sheriff should not be held to a one minute clock. That's shameful. Um, the fact that the sheriff sent a representative to read a statement and will not take any questions is just further evidence that he is not fit 
to be our sheriff. Sheriff Villanueva must go. He transferred 46 personnel he found problematic to another station. Are they terrorizing another section of our county somewhere? The answer to that is yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Bonner. Thank you so much for the call for a subpoena about this. Bravo to that. Who on this commission is going to take the steps to reach out to our state attorney general? Why are we dancing around this? Our county is not safe with Villanueva as our sheriff. Andres Guardado, Dijon Quise, Paul Rea. These names, say them over and over again. And why do we need to keep adding to the list of names we have to say? Body cameras will do nothing to hold them accountable. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Joseph Mazlich. Please go ahead and comment, Joseph. Uh, yes, uh, good uh, morning, good noontime, uh, uh, commissioners. Um, the core to me of the recommendations and the report about the bandidos is the sentence investigators should follow all LASD policies and procedures and should apply the same investigative practices to investigations relating to alleged gang behavior of deputies as would be employed in the investigation of serious crime by a serious crime by a suspect who is not an employee of LASD. That seems to be the core to me. And I include in that uh, gen more generally um, the behavior. If the residents are supposed to be um, aware of our rights and obligations, of course, it should go for the department and the people who ideally are setting examples. Uh, this is actually training. It's training of the deputies, it's training of the public when we see whether or not that equal policies and equal pursuit of violations is taking place. Worth Thank more you. than all the rest of the training. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Andres Kwan. Please go ahead with your comment, Andres. Andres Kwan, ACLU. Um, I see that there are some key takeaways from the report. Uh, one, that the bandidos ex obviously exist uh, in East LA, but we've known this all along. Uh, and these are deputy gangs. Let me say it again, gangs, not whatever you want to call them, not so-called cliques or subgroups or secret societies, gangs. Two, LAC's internal affairs has been horrendous at investigating bandidos' misconduct, especially the failure to compel deputies to, to provide statements uh, when they're not target deputies, violating their own policies. Three, DA Jackie Lacey, who's deeply conflicted given ALATS and police union political contributions, has turned a blind eye to deputy gangs. She's come up with rationale for declining to prosecute when the clear facts in the record clamor the exact opposite. Uh, DA Lacey has completely enabled the bandidos and other deputy gangs to run amok. In light of this report, they actually submitted a letter to you yesterday. I just uh, urge you to read that. And, and to, to, to end, lastly, to share Villanueva, War has it, or tomorrow language. People know that you've been a member of the bandidos. Show it to chaps. We dare you to prove us wrong. And, and, and the next comment will come from Ernest. Please go ahead with your comment, Ernest. Yes, uh, testing, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, I have, uh, in fact, me and other uh, community activists, including Eddie Jones, had complained about deputy gangs, racist against black American deputy gangs seven or eight years ago to the uh, LA County Board of Supervisors. I don't like how this is progressing. Uh, Jackie Lacey knows about it. She's protecting them just like Mark Riley Thomas. Uh, these are racists against black American gangs that came out, came from the streets from the illegal alien gangs. Uh, if you know the, the, son, the, the man that killed uh, Jamil Shah, Shah's son, just because he was black, was from a gang that had uh, gang members that specialized in killing black Americans. They had a special tattoo, which is, uh, I believe, NK, which means nigger killer. These gangs, these Mexican gangs are nigger killers. And we need to, I want to uh, set up a specialized law enforcement agency to police the police, to protect black Americans. And, and the next comment, the next comment will come from M. W, please go ahead and comment, M.W. Yes, I'm reminded, Commissioner, that the sheriff has time to talk each on Instagram, but not appear here. So the analysis here today, the lawlessness of the internal investigation of and others, it is misconduct of the sheriff. 
that he has shown, they have done everything to do to corrupt these reports. I am disgusted, and hopefully all of you are too, and then you will send no, con no confidence to the supervisors. The OIG being redacted comments in the Kobe Bryant investigation, horrific. Until the Benditos have been properly invested dismantled. The residents of Los Angeles are being placed in danger by the very people, billions of tax to utilize to protect and the DDoS is only the tip of the iceberg committed Kennedy months ago. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Michelle Infante. Michelle, please go ahead with your comment. Uh, this is Michelle Infante with Dignity Power Now. The OIG report implies the need for independent investigation. Everybody looked at that report and read that conversation in there. It showed how the Sheriff's Department manipulates and creates a, a narrative by not asking pertinent questions like Max Huntsman mentioned, not following up with questions, asking a female about a male deputy gang and deputies with prior assaults. Um, this is crazy. Can you imagine what they're doing with shooting investigations uh, out on the street and in custody deaths? The narratives that are being written are so manipulated by the Sheriff's Department that it's become a standard practice to read these fantasy stories. And you just read one of them in the report today from Max Huntsman's office. I appreciate that report. It really says a lot about how the Sheriff's Department manipulates conversations and tries to gather the narrative to their advantage and benefit from it. Thank you. And the next comment will come from TK. Please go ahead and comment, TK. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so we definitely need an, an independent investigation. The people responsible for the crimes cannot investigate themselves. There's lack of transparency, um, which allows for greater misconduct and sealing officers and their histories of misconduct. We absolutely need the Attorney General to look into this because DA Jackie Lacey refuses to do her job and prosecuting killer cops. We absolutely need to defund the sheriff's department and we need to get rid of Sheriff Villanueva. I hear Max Huntman say it's a slow process and it's even slower process during the COVID. I think that this commission needs to come up with some other solutions. The same people that created these laws are committing these crimes. So there has to be a workaround for subpoenaing the sheriff and holding him accountable. He thinks he's above the law. This commission needs to become creative. Since all Thank the you. laws are fraudulent, Thank excuse you. me? Thank you, your time is up. And okay. the next comment will come from Q, John Marie. Go ahead with your comment. Yes, um, I would like to say that the, um, uh, reiterate what some folks have already indicated, right? The LAUSD cannot, I mean, the LASD cannot uh, investigate itself. And the fact that Jackie Lacey is getting $2 million from police associations for her reelection, there's a direct conflict of interest. She's not gonna do anything, right? In this system, there's no accountability. There's a scripture that says bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same system. This system is, is, is bitter, right? There's no confidence in the sheriff and so I'm hoping that this board is as appalled as I am, this commission is a, uh, as appalled as I am, and will uh, vote on a no confidence uh, vote for VNWA. But he needs to resign. He needs to get out of here. And the fact that the solution to problematic, to, to sheriff gangs is to transfer them somewhere else, this is, this is ridiculous. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Celeste Sibre. Please go ahead with your Celeste. Hi, good morning or good afternoon. I'd like to address the board a little bit, back backpedaling a little bit. I know um, it's 
I'm, I'm new at this, so I'm a little behind, but I'm deeply disturbed at the board's opinion and enactment of reducing the budget for LASD. Uh, it shows a blatant disregard for public safety in high crime neighborhoods like the one that I live in. I'm a regular mom juggling online instruction for my child, caring for a three-year-old, and then finishing off my day with a full-time paid job. A uh, few moment, uh, I get a few moments in between to think about why in the world appointed officials or oversight commissions like yourselves would think it was okay to defund, you know, the very people that protect us. I pray to God that I never have to call 911 and only to get a busy tone. Unfortunately, decisions are being made on hypothetical circumstances with unrealistic outcomes. Um, I straggle in at midnight to my home every day to get a few hours of shed eye. And it was very disturbing to me that it was, it was so evident that it's never been so clear cut to me that a few weeks ago among us was lurking a, a perpetrator uh, uh, that caught the attention of national national attention with the uh, and, and that yeah. that's your it. time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and the next comment will come from Hannah Janeway. Please go ahead with your Hannah. Yeah, thank you so much for letting me speak. Um, my name is Dr. Hannah Janeway. I'm a physician at one of the LA County hospitals. Um, I just you know, thank you for all the work you guys are doing, but it's just incredible to me that the LA County De Sheriff's Department is allowed to continue to perpetuate these crimes against members of the community. They don't just do it on the streets, they also do it in the hospitals where they walk around without impunity. They threaten providers, they have threatened me, they ask for things that they're not allowed to have under law. Um, they have threatened they have threatened providers in a recent meeting with doing a sting operation and arresting us for trying to protect our patients from them. So I, I really like something has to change and you guys are the people who are going to make it happen. Um, this cannot continue to happen the way it is. They have just are they're out of control. So I don't know what you guys need to do, but I like the idea of going to, you know, the state attorney general. This needs to go up the line of command and you guys need to do something about this. It's out of control. Thank you. And the comment will come from Joseph Gomez. Please go ahead with your comment, Joseph. Hello, um, I, I just spoke about uh, the last public comment session about defunding the sheriff's department. I'd like to speak about that again um, and, and tell you why, why, why that why that would be very dangerous. Um, I personally had had uh, one race. Um, I've been racially profiled one time by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. However, I do understand that not all of these sheriffs are out there to to. Um, to target members of the black and brown community. And I understand we need to take care of the deputy gangs and they do need to be properly investigated and not by the sheriff's department, by an outside agency, including the uh, California attorney general. Um, but defunding the police is not the solution. It's simply not the solution. We have kids in schools that are overdosing on drugs. We have the sheriff's department regularly routinely brings in their K-9 to um, search the school, and you might say the prison to pipe, or the school to pipeline, the prison to pipeline, I believe it's called. Um, no, it doesn't lead to that. It actually stops students from overdosing on these drugs within the schools. Thank you, and that does conclude your time. The next speaker will be Doreen Sanchez. Please go ahead with your comment. Doreen Sanchez, you are muted. Please go ahead with your comment. Okay, hearing nothing, moving on to you, Adriana Quinones. Please go ahead with your comment, Adriana. Okay, still hearing nothing. Um, we'll move on to the last public comment from Jacqueline Venters. Please go ahead with your comment, Jacqueline. Yes, good morning, everybody, and thanks for allowing me to uh, be able to speak. Again, I'm speaking on behalf of my son, Janelle Phillips, and I'm just curious of what the outcome is going to be with the. Uh, Sheriff Oversight Committee, Mark Ridley Thomas Office, and um, Inspector General. With all this information that you guys are receiving with this corruption from our Sheriff Department, I've been telling the same story for nine years of the wrongful shooting of my son. I want this Deputy Gonzalo Azusa Mark, um, investigated. And also I want the public defender. This is deeper than the Sheriff Department when it comes to the criminal activity as it rolls over into the courtroom. Right now, I'm waiting on some information to, that my son's been waiting on for nine years from Mike Suzuki from the Public Defender's Office, and I want to each and every one of you that has been instrumental in 
helping me get to this part, but I want to know what you're going to do. I need to come home. This has been going Thank on. Thank you. Scary. Thank you. And that does conclude your time. We'll try Adriana Quinones again. Please see if you can speak now, Adriana. Okay, still hearing nothing. Um, this does conclude public comment for this item, Lael. All right. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, as I mentioned earlier this morning, we have a very busy and full agenda and um, agenda item number uh, 2D relates to the resolution regarding the Los Angeles County Sheriff and we need a considerable amount of time to discuss that. Um, after the last meeting, the um, commission agreed to have the newly formed resolution ad hoc committee develop a resolution addressing some of the concerns of um, Sheriff Villanueva's leadership. Um, I first want to thank the ad hoc committee um, in advance of their discussion. Um, in particular, the um, chair of the committee, Patty Giggins, um, the staff analyst, Eric Montalban Lara, and everybody who worked very hard on this. Um, Patty, you're the chair of this um, um, resolution ad hoc committee. Please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Rubin. Um, yes, it is, uh, first of all, I wanna really appreciate the uh, commissioners uh, we had to do some heavy lifting, heavy thinking and discerning um, about this task that was ahead of us. And uh, so Priscilla Ocean, um, uh, Commissioner Bonner, Commissioner Harris, and of course, Eric Montalban Lara from staff were extremely diligent in considering the actions that we feel um, that we have to take. Uh, and that we're recommending in this resolution to express the grave concerns that we have and that we have heard from the community for a couple of years now. Um, it is, um, you know, we all know that uh, when Commissioner Bonner personally gave his opinion, as he said, it was his personal opinion that the sheriff uh, should resign, that set a lot of uh, adrenaline and emotion and commentary and thinking. Um, and um, what we what we did in our deliberations was come to what we see is a very fair but firm expression of our grave concerns regarding the sheriff's leadership of LASD. Uh, and in particular, his failure to cooperate with the Civilian Oversight Commission. Um, unfortunately, Sheriff uh, Villanueva has vilified the commission, has practically at every public turn tried to delegitimize our charge, our mandate, and our very existence. Um, and so after uh, get this going on for, for many months, obviously um, the um, handcuffs that have been put on uh, Inspector General Max Huntsman um, further deteriorates the relationship and the credibility that the sheriff has with the community as we have heard over and over and over again from many community members. And we, I would say reluctantly have feel like we have been pushed to make a resolution like this that expresses the deep um, concerns that we have about being able to move forward. And we do wanna move forward. Um, so when we talk about grave concerns in our resolution, we are talking about some of the follow-up that doesn't happen. We're talking about, again, challenging the authority of the commission, uh, personalizing many of the uh, personalizing things about commissioners and others. 
Um, and so now we're at this point. So this is a resolution that has had um, a lot of thought put into it. Um, and at the same time, we don't want to close the door on having a better relationship, having a collaborative working relationship with the sheriff. Um, and in a way, that is our ultimate goal. It's the goal of the commission as a whole. The goal of this resolution is to express the concerns and still ask for an opportunity to move forward and work together. Um, we feel that we're not going anywhere. We know what our charge is. We have a mandate. Civilian oversight is a state of the art now in the country, and it's going to become more and more state of the art um, across the country. Um, sheriff's departments will not be successful without oversight. It's not a possibility. So we urge a Sheriff Villanueva and the people who advise him to reconsider his combative and um, denigrating relationship with the Civilian Oversight Commission, with us. Um, and um, we're expressing our grave concern, and we have put it before you all have it, uh, commissioners. You're taking a look at it, and uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, our chairperson for the conversation. Um, thank you, Patty. Um, before we get to individual comments, I think it's um, really important to hear from members of um, uh, this, the ad hoc commission who worked on this, um, because they each devoted a great deal of time and input, and um, I, I want to have them um, have an opportunity to um, add on to what what um, Patty Giggins had to say, um, and any anything else that they want to add um, as an initial opening to this discussion. So, um, Priscilla, you want to get started? Um, I'll let uh, Robin uh, JP speak first, and then I'll comment. Commissioner Bonner. Um, yeah, uh, I did all. And, and, uh, and it's very, I think, very well put in many ways. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, um, just for the record, I, I need to, and I wish to disassociate myself from uh, a small part of the fourth whereas clause that essentially applauds the sheriff for banning transfers to ICE. Uh, I believe, and I, I've stated this before, that the sheriff should transfer when requested by federal authorities, persons convicted of serious and violent crimes who are uh, unlawfully in the United States. But uh, otherwise, I support the resolution. I intend to vote for the resolution. Personally, I would go further uh, for the reason I uh, our last meeting, uh, I think it's in the best interest of the sheriff's department itself and the people of the county of Los Angeles that the sheriff resign. But um, I think this is an appropriate, I don't think it's appropriate for the full commission to take that position because we have to do what we can to um, maintain, if that can be done, a relationship of cordiality and productivity. every night I do support the resolution for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. JP. You're but you're muted. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Commissioner Bonner, um, you know, there's certain parts of it I'm not crazy about, but I will say unequivocally I support the uh, the basic um, attitude that is trying to convey. I, I appreciate um, the ad hoc committee's chair, uh, Giggins, in that our goal here is to work with the sheriff, but we really feel compelled uh, to be very honest with him and let him know where we have some grave concerns, and we do have some grave concerns. 
we continue to want to work with the sheriff and the sheriff's department. Um, but we do, we do feel compelled that it's necessary to make these great concerns known. Uh, like uh, Commissioner Bonner said, you know, maybe part, portions of it that uh, any one of us may not totally agree with, but I think overall, uh, I, I can wholeheartedly support this resolution. Priscilla? Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, you know, this sheriff uh, during his tenure has engaged in lies and uh, uh, has engaged in cover-ups uh, with regard to um, sheriff's deputy gangs, with regard to Kobe Bryant, with regard to um, other matters related to uh, deputy discipline, starting from uh, the very first month uh, that he was um, sworn into office uh, with Deputy Mendoyan. Um, the sheriff's department all has always, or not always, but in the most recent history has, has had problems with violence, abuse, and neglect in, uh, on, on patrol and in custody, in the custody environment. But under Sheriff Villanueva, uh, from my perspective, um, that culture has been exacerbated um, because of his willingness to defend um, indefensible actions by sheriff's deputies, abusing protesters, arresting journalists, um, having spokespeople who utter racist and despicable um, uh, comments about uh, black communities and communities in Compton. The sheriff himself has used sexist and racist language to describe uh, um, Supervisor Hilda Solis um, and has not apologized uh, to date. Um, he fails to take responsibility for the problems in the department, blaming everyone else, uh, including people on this commission. He's accused me of having a conflict of interest uh, for dignity and power now, which I don't completely understand. He's accused Patty Giggins of having a, a, um, a, a conflict of interest, despite the fact that um, a piece of our violence does amazing work, including work with the sheriff's department. He's accused Sean Kennedy of having a conflict of interest for I, reasons that are, are unclear to me. He has suggested that Commissioner Bonner um, is not fully uh, the, the intellectual architect of the call to, to for, for a, uh, Sheriff Inouye's resignation, that, that we've been directed by the Board of Supervisors to engage in some sort of proxy war. Um, so he blames everyone else, including the former sheriff, for the problems that he is responsible for, that his department is responsible for under his administration. He's refused to uh, implement important reforms, particularly in the era of COVID-19, when our jail populations are, uh, are, are so high that they are deadly. Um, and that they pose a public risk, not only to the people who are in custody, in the custody environment, both people who are being held and the staff, they pose a risk in terms of the spread of COVID-19 into our broad, broader, broader communities. And importantly, the sheriff has blocked our efforts at oversight um, from the commission and from the OIG. Uh, today was an example of that, having someone come and read a letter uh, and, and, you know, Mr. Lopez, this is not a slight to you, but to have someone come and re read a letter about an issue as critical as deputy gangs and not be prepared to have a response is the kind of disrespect that he has routinely showed um, this commission, the Board of Supervisors, um, uh, civilian oversight, and the residents of this county who voted to empower this commission with Measure R subpoena power. So to say that we have grave concerns is an understatement. Uh, this resolution was a compromise uh, amongst the members of the resolution committee. Personally, I join uh, Commissioner Bonner in calling for uh, uh, Sheriff Villanueva to step down. I don't have confidence in his leadership, and I think that this commission should take that position. But again, um, this was a compromise, and uh, an expression of grave concerns is at the minimum of what is warranted at this moment. Um, so I'm going to be voting for this resolution, although I would call for the sheriff to step down, and I personally I do not have confidence in the leadership of the sheriff's department. The idea that uh, not calling for his resignation and, and not expressing that we have a lack of confidence in him would preserve an opportunity for us to work with him. Look, we've always been in the same place. We continually invite the sheriff to the table. We've tried to facilitate um, conversations with the community about uh, uh, problems like deputy gangs, uh, killings of, 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 of residents like Andres Guardado or Dijon Kizzy, 
or uh, Ryan Twyman or so many others that I can name, and he has refused. Um, uh, excuse me, Ryan Twyman was maybe a little bit earlier, but he's refused those particular um, invitations. So we've been here. We've been asking for the sheriff to engage. He's the one who has stepped back and said, no, um, I'm not going to uh, adhere to the wishes of the voters, the board of supervisors, and uh, to civilian oversight. And I think um, it's time that we say that's enough. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Tolentino. Um, I'd like to echo uh, Commissioner Ocean's uh, statement. She spoke very clearly of all the concerns that I had, and I too would have joined uh, Commissioner Bonner's request for a resignation. But I realize we have a compromise, though, and we have to work with this with the sheriff. Uh, it seems to me that the big elephant of the worm is the words that Commissioner Oatsen has, has said and has said it already, but that's no confidence. Maybe we can add in the resolution expressing grave concerns and adding no confidence regarding Sheriff Villanueva's leadership. Uh, I will be supporting the resolution even without those words, but I think those words uh, is the big elephant in the worm. I mean, we don't, uh, I don't think we all agree that it, it, it's just grave concerns. I mean, I'm willing to go all the way to uh, asking for his resignation. Um, with that in mind, I would uh, make a motion to uh, just add those two words in our resolution. Um, is there um, is there a second to that? I second that. Madam Chair, can I add something real quick to that? Yes, I think there's an issue. To uh, Commissioner Tolentino's point and his um, amendment, um, I would add that unfortunately the the sheriff has spoken with his feet on this issue. We have, uh, at, at, after many requests. Uh, so we had started monthly meetings with executive staff from the sheriff's department, and we had one meeting, one, one meeting, and we were told recently that those meetings would not continue until further notice. So, like I said, I think after hearing these expressions of concern last month, <clears throat> that was his decision. We hope that those meetings will start again. Uh, but I do think that the sheriff has voted with his feet on that, and I do support uh, Commissioner Tolentino's uh, amendment to the to the motion. Any other commissioners want to speak at this point? Um, okay, I think that um, we should. Um, uh, Jennifer, how many how many people have signed up for public comment? I don't believe I have an accurate count right now, but it's looking around 15. I think you're muted, Leo. Why don't we proceed with public comment and then um, we will come back and uh, take a vote. Um, one minute each, please. Okay, and first a comment in Spanish. Si gustaría que le traduzcan sus comentarios en español, por favor, simplemente diga la palabra español antes de comenzar sus comentarios y alguien va a traducir sus comentarios cuando termine. Gracias. Thank you. And the first comment will come from Genevieve Claveral. Genevieve, please go ahead with your comment. <laughs> Genevieve, you are unmuted. Please go ahead with your comment. Yeah. Well, my Wi-Fi. Uh, it well. seems as though Genevieve is not speaking to us, so we will move on. The next comment will come from Audrey George. Please go ahead with your comment, Audrey. Okay. Um, although I appreciate the commitment of the COC to submit this resolution to BOS, I regret that several commissioners still seem so hesitant about it. Even though it falls far, far short of asking for Villanueva's resignation, it doesn't go nearly far enough. It mostly recites the growing list of significant and well-known grievances against the sheriff's egregious acts of malfeasance. The COC should submit an even clearer statement to the BOS, indicating an absolute vote of no confidence in Villanueva, and joining others that include Supervisors Kuhl and Ridley Thomas, Impacted Families, Justice LA, BLM LA, ACLU of Southern California, 
check the Sheriff Coalition and over 50 other organizations. And Commissioner Bonner, in light of your record of often aligning yourself with LASD's PR spin, I hope you've given thought about reasons why your fellow commissioners and the activist community were so frankly surprised that you proposed the COC resolution of no confidence in the sheriff. Perhaps the reaction of your having taken that initiative has helped influence your thinking and advocacy about ways you can provide. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Gina Viola. Gina, please go ahead with your comment. Thank you. I don't know how anybody can read a resolution like this and it not end with a demand for the sheriff's resignation. I don't understand when it seems like almost the lion's share of the folks who worked on this resolution all want his resignation, why it is not part of this resolution. It absolutely needs to be so. He is a danger to our county. You know this, and you know he will never show up here. He's, you've given him ample opportunity, ample moments to come before you. He will never work with this group, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Anthony John. Please go ahead with your comment, Mark Anthony. Um, so I just, you know, I just want to say that, you know, as someone who fought for this commission to be created, who worked with families, but experienced tremendous levels of, of abuse and was so excited, excited uh, that this thing was established. Uh, and can acknowledge the brilliant work that you all have done up to this point. It is deeply disappointing that we are talking about concerns. Everyone that has followed y'all's work and y'all's leadership know the concerns. They can read the OIG support. You have an opportunity to take this further because it's bigger than the sheriff. It's about other leadership in the department. It's about ground level folks in the department. This is beyond concerns. It's beyond concerns and you all can take it to that point and we need you to take it to that point. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Joseph Maslich. Please go ahead with your comment, Joseph. Um, hello, commissioners. <clears throat> um, whether uh, I'm, I was glad to hear earlier on in the meeting, the discussion of options, although um, options that the board and people besides the sheriff can take uh, on this, um, and I'm uh, very pleased that this, this uh, still, even now, asks for talks and, and frank talks and establishing a relationship. Should always do that. I don't think asking for resignation. I mean, how are you going to convince them to to resign? You'll convince them to resign by starting the processes that you have that uh, will uh, help you deal with somebody who's recalcitrant and not being the example that law enforcement should be for um, the people of the county. I'd, I'd like there to be a companion resolution sometime in the future about the context uh, in which law enforcement tries to take place. I think you can have a good voice urging uh, support for from the county and from the state for all the services that the impacted and disinvested areas of the counties and cities here need. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from M.W. Please go ahead with your comment. I want to urge this committee explicitly include a ask for immediate resignation of felt the sheriff in line with commission ocean statements. I'm going to work with a doing every power to justice. You have been to. IG today explain how this individual knows how to work the system to be able to corrupt and cover his tracks, not calling for his when you know jeopardizing the safe Angelino that makes this body complicit murders of the SD. Next month, one else's name is spoken here and you have not called for his resignation, it will be because you had to do the power, power, but you chose to do nothing. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Alex Cave. Please go ahead with your comment, Alex. Thank you so much. I agree that asking for his resignation should be universal. He 
obviously isn't giving you guys a choice. He's not going to work with you. There's a reason that residents of L.A. refer to him as the Trump of L.A. He acts childish. He calls out LeBron James for supporting Black Lives Matter and not supporting the sheriffs who were killed, which, of course, is a tragedy. But he doesn't even put that effort into the 10 people who have been killed since George Floyd's murder back in May. It's shameful. This is Los Angeles. We have the largest reputation of police violence in the country. And while he yells at celebrities, his staff, meanwhile, are sharing photos of Kobe's horrifying plane crash. He clearly has no value for black and brown LA residents. He ignores what this committee is asking for, what the people want. He's not a dictator. He works for us. We elected him. He doesn't agree with you, and it's embarrassing. I hope you watch that Josie Huang video where his department lied about how they attacked her brutally, and their LASDHQ Twitter spreads lies as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Andres Kwan. Please go ahead with your comment, Andres. Andres Kwan, ACLU. Uh, the LA Times today wrote the following, and I quote, uh, last month, two supervisors and several members of the COC called on Villanueva to resign, echoing calls by a number of organizations. The commission was set to take up a resolution on the subject, but it appears to have lost its nerve. And now members will instead consider a motion that merely expresses grave concerns. Uh, on July 29th, uh, ACLU, alongside 50 other coalitions and organizations, demanded Villanueva's immediate resignation. Commissioners, we're dealing with the Trump of LA, somebody mentioned. And at this point, we have nothing to lose. Have we learned anything about Trump? Villanueva has walked all over you, civilian oversight, defying subpoenas, stonewalling Mr. Huntsman, and in the most Trumpian move, starting a criminal investigation of him. What door are you talking about? You mean the one that's been shut and locked? We urge you today to demand the immediate resignation of being weapon. The resolution should be a clear vote of no confidence. And we also urge you to consider a charter amendment that gives the power yeah. uh, to impeach and remove the sheriff and give greater powers to the COC and the OIG. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Julie Martinez. Julie, please go ahead with your comment. As we've witnessed, 10 deaths at the hand of LA County Sheriff's of George Floyd. It is obvious that and his minions of deputies just do not care. As the world witnesses, the pain that law enforcement in America is racist and operates as a criminal syndicate towards community colors. And we witness that the sheriff continues to operate with impunity. It's, it's about time that we realized that Sheriff Ian Weva should leave. Obama. He is clearly over his head. He cannot meet this moment. Please take a stronger stance to rid loss of Sheriff Ian Weva. Thank you. Thank you. And the last public comment will come from Ernest Moore. Please go ahead with your comment. Yes, as a victim of LA County Sheriff's deputies, uh, when I was assaulted back in 2001 after I beat a, a criminal case where I was uh, attempted, uh, I was attempted frame up by uh, some LAPD officers, and I was assaulted in the judge's parking lot. This, uh, what you're doing here to me seems like to be a waste of time. Uh, you should be focusing on taking him to jail as well as Jackie Lacey and other members of the board, LA County Board of Supervisors for their uh, blatant uh, corruption that's running rampant, has been running rampant in this county for decades. This cannot be tolerated at all. And I don't understand, it, uh, you, uh, this, uh, this commission needs an enforcement branch. Again, as I've been saying over and over in my uh, public comments, because we need um, immediate solutions for this. Thank you. Thank you. And we did have four additional individuals sign up for public comment. Next, you will hear from Pastor Hugh John Marie. Please go ahead with your comment, Pastor Hugh. Um, it seems like it continues to mute you. We'll move on to Joseph Gomez and we'll come back to Pastor Q. Please go ahead, Joseph. Hi, um, so I just wanted to urge you um, not to include the letter of resignation for uh, Sheriff Villanueva. Um, I feel as these people are very mad that he protects his deputies as he should, as he does employ them. Um, I'd also like to say if uh, 
you would uh, impeach Sheriff Villanueva, that you nominate uh, Sheriff or uh, Captain James uh, Teicheru of the Norwalk Sheriff Station for um, Sheriff of Los Angeles County. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. And we'll go back to Pastor Q. Please go ahead with your comment. Pastor Q, please go ahead with your comment. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Please go All ahead. All right. Yeah, so uh, this is troubling to me. We, as uh, Andres uh, communicated in July after uh, Andres was murdered by the sheriff department, uh, his father uh, being part of one of our local unions, we called for the resignation of Villanueva. We called for his resignation because he had a long rap sheet beginning with Mandoyan. And now we're hearing that Mandoyan, it was proven that Mandoyan is part of the gang. So if Mandoyan was part of the gang, it makes me think that this was a favor to him from one of the people in that gang, which would be uh, Sheriff Villanueva. We don't know who we're dealing with. We're dealing with the Green Reaper or are we dealing with the Sheriff of uh, Los Angeles? We're not sure. And so this is why we have no confidence and we should be calling for the resignation of the sheriff. I don't understand why that's a problem. I can't see, I don't see what we're trying to deliberate here. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Mary Rachel. Thank you. Hi. Comment, Mary. Hi, so sorry about that. Uh, first and foremost, I hope you can hear me and I want to acknowledge the COC for existing. Thank you. Honestly, God bless. Um, I'm unfortunately officially a victim of a hate crime uh, starting in July of this summer. I think that a lot of it uh, escalated at the George Floyd incident. <clears throat> uh, my heart honestly goes to all of the people that have lost somebody. Um, I just lost items. My home was broken into. Uh, compromised, completely disrespected and violated. I mean, I don't, I don't feel safe. I've been now living in East LA. I'm going to be going on a year now. Um, is coming up and I thought I would be celebrating it. And I, I think there's a lot of potential in East LA and there's a lot that's being ignored. And I agree. I'm going to add on. The villain wave has got to go. He's the Trump of LA. He's a pompous bully. I think he might be involved with some of these gangs. He, he defines them as frats. And I went to USC. I'm going to tell you right now, frats, they're terrible. They got to go. There's a lot of hazing and people have died because of this. Thank you. And the very last public comment on this item will come from Jack. Please go ahead with your comment, Jacqueline. Yes, I was. Uh... Jacqueline, please go ahead with your comment. We heard you for a second. Okay, it looks like we're not hearing Jacqueline. Um, that does conclude our public comment on this item, then, uh, Chair Rubin. Um, thank you for that. Um, before we um, before we go to um, vote on the resolution and the amendment to the resolution, I have a couple of comments that I would like to make um, as the chair. Um, needless to say, the um, the original request made by Commissioner Bonner. Last month was um, heartfelt and courageous and um, not one that um, he had previously discussed with any members of the commission. So it was something that we didn't know about. Um, the um, um, ad hoc committee that has spent, uh, as I mentioned initially, an inordinate amount of time working on this resolution um, and making um, uh, heroic attempts to um, come up with something that would um, perhaps signal to the sheriff that we're serious, um, but that the ball would now be in his court to make things better. Um, I've given this a lot of thought. I don't think he... Um, has any intention of making things better. Um, one example, I think, is um, the material that he had submitted to this commission. One, the um, uh, fairly poor analysis of the, investig um, the OIG's 
report on um, deputy gangs um, and um, uh, what was it that his representative did today, but to um, have um, somebody come and read it, um, as has been previously mentioned, it was rather demeaning. We could read it. We have read it um, rather than um, discussing an analysis or um, making an argument for the sheriff's point of view. Um, he's uh, directed to come and read a letter. Um, and uh, that's again, no fault of him. He does. Those were his marching orders. And then um, the um, sheriff did uh, respond um, with a, about a page and a half in response to the proposed resolution, which um, uh, the uh, executive director, Mr. Williams, distributed today. Um, and again, it is something that is very um, demeaning to the to the commission, demeaning to members of the community, um, and really gives a sense that um, he really has no intention of working with us. So I would at this point join those um, colleagues of mine calling for his uh, resignation. Um, one would have hoped that after the, during the last month with all of that discussion and um, uh, comments, public comments and comments in, um, in news articles that um, he would take some of that to heart. Um, he obviously has not. And so I find that um, I cannot do anything else other than um, urge that this commission um, vote that um, it is our position that he should resign. Yeah. Um, yes, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Kennedy. Uh, yes, I, I, I agree, uh, uh, Chair. I think the force of this commission is our integrity as volunteers who want to make an impact, a positive impact on policing in our community. And it seems like a majority of this commission uh, believes that the sheriff uh, uh, should be called upon to resign. And the fact that we may not be successful doesn't mean we shouldn't speak up uh, for what is true and right. So I make a motion that we uh, amend the resolution to call for the sheriff's resignation. Uh, um, Is there a second? Second. Any, any further comments or discussion? I just wanted to offer some language um, uh, to to clarify to maybe um, uh, clarify the the resolution if we want to include both the resolution of no confidence and have a provision that calls for his resignation. Um, uh, so let me know when it's appropriate to offer that language so that we can consider. Or maybe we vote on these two motions and then I can offer uh, clarifying language. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Commissioner uh, Giggins. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, well, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> um, I want to say that, Commissioner Rubin, your opinion and the way you just stated it uh, is impacting me greatly. I mean, part of my, I'm a very practical person. So the, um, the idea that we would call for resignation, it wouldn't happen. For me, I put it in almost like, is that a failure? Um, so that, you know, so I always have this very practical side. I'm an implementer. Um, but I have to say that after being chair for two terms, um, I was hopeful with your chairship and your um, commitment to help steer the ship in a little a different direction, um, I was I was feeling hopeful about that. You know, a change of leadership and meetings that were set up. Um, but what you said today was that the meetings you don't think they're going to happen, and or if they were, they would not be productive. 
the meetings that you and uh, I, I, I gather Vice Chair Vera and also our Executive Director were invited to attend or you invited yourselves to attend. So I just want to say that um, we, you know, we part of what our committee did, um, and of course, it's, uh, you know, it, it always has to be some compromise. Um, but what we tried to do was not err on the side of not making something happen, right? Uh, the sheriff, by us calling for the sheriff to resign, um, and I heard a couple of the people sp spoke to that, uh, and he doesn't resign, you know, where does that leave us? I think that's one of the considerations. Where does that leave us as a commission doing oversight? Um, and I do want to say that many, many people who work for the LASD are amazing. And many that we have worked with and continue to work with, and hopefully somehow can, are amazing and very committed and are smart. Um, so I, um, again, I just want to say I appreciate your your position um and i am in reflection right now thank you jp did you did you look like you had your hand up and i, and I did thank you chair ruben i i like uh commissioner gagans i'm sort of a practical kind of guy and i share her concern although i will also share her statement, uh, you, you, Chair Rubin, were very uh, persuasive, not that I haven't been. Um, I understand the frustration of the public, uh, the commission. That frustration is deeply shared by me, deeply shared by me. Uh, I would hope that we could work with the sheriff and the executives in his department to, to continue to improve things. but. I'm not sure if that's possible, and I'm real concerned that with a vote of no confidence and asking for his resignation that basically slams the door on this commission, and we've got two plus more years of this sheriff before there's another election. And there's no way I know what I've heard the public many times say, you know, we should fire the sheriff and I hope those people that say that recognize we don't have that authority, nor does the Board of Supervisors, nor does anyone. The only way the sheriff can be removed from office is by a recall election. Now, that hasn't happened. So it looks like and even if one were to start today, I don't know that we would see an election to recall anyone prior to the next election. Therefore, where does that leave us? We can make a statement, and it'll be a loud statement heard by many, and many will applaud us for our courage. And I'm not trying to diminish the importance of having the bully pulpit and saying those things that need to be said. Words do matter. I know that. But I am still deeply concerned by taking an action to call for his resignation. All we are going to do is basically uh, take every bit of power we ever had, which wasn't much, uh, other than our voice, which again is important, and in mute it to where I don't know that anything much will get accomplished over the next two years. And that deeply concerns me because we do have a lot of work to do with the sheriff's department. So I like Commissioner Giggins. I'm I'm not quite sure how I feel on this. This is a real this is a real tough one. Um, I but I I want everyone to know my fellow commissioners and the public that's listening that I do indeed share those grave concerns. I know that term seems to not carry enough weight in the minds of some people, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I am deeply concerned about the direction this sheriff's department has been going for the last two years, and I'm even more deeply concerned about the direction it's going to take in the next two years. And I'm afraid, calling for a vote of 
no confidence and or the resignation of the sheriff is going to make that journey that much more difficult. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bonner. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to have a resolution adopted by the full commission which closed the door to both our chair and vice chair having meetings candid meetings and discussions with the sheriff about issues that was our concern i i'm listening very carefully to our chair here because if in fact the door is closed, and frankly we're just saying that there's no way that it's going to open, um, then uh, we're in a bit different position than I think we were when we were considering this resolution. Uh, let me say that, um, you know, the very fact that the sheriff apparently has not invited the chair of the Civilian Oversight Commission, the chair of the Civilian Oversight Commission, uh, you, Lael, to sit down, meet, and discuss issues speaks volumes. Maybe the door is closed. If you tell me the door is closed, let me let me say this. At our last meeting, I called for the resignation of the sheriff. I explained why. And implicitly by doing so, I was saying that I personally have no confidence in Sheriff Villanueva. And to say I don't have confidence in him is an understatement. So if you're saying they that we're, you know, the bridges are all burned here, and that's what we're going to be saying if we vote for it. Uh, if the bridges are all burned, uh, inconsistent. I've already taken a position that I lack confidence in the sheriff, and I've asked that he resign. If that's the motion, I'm going to vote for it. But I, I do, I'm mindful of the practicalities of what uh, former Mayor Gagan said and uh, Commissioner Harris that uh, we are saying here, let's, uh, let's understand what we're doing. We're saying that. Uh, uh, the bridges have already been burned, so we're not burning any bridges here. Um, and if that's the case, then God, let's go forward with the with the motion. But let's be sure that that's the case. And I really would put it to you, Chair Rubin. I mean, first of all, have you had an opportunity? To, I mean, if you were question, have you had an opportunity to meet with the sheriff and have uh, you and perhaps Vice Vice Chair uh, Vera? I mean, and sit down and discuss things with him, or is it, or do you view that? that hasn't happened and you don't view that as a realistic possibility. I'd like to hear more from you because it will influence how I vote on this. Um, just just so that we're, we're clear about this, um, we had um, one meeting with the sheriff and the under sheriff, Commissioner um, Vera, um, Mr. Williams and myself in August. We had a second meeting um, that would have been a month later. Um, and after the um, our last COC meeting, um, we were supposed to have another regular meeting. Um, and what was communicated to us was um, that meeting is canceled than any future meetings. So um, as far as I know, and Mr. Williams can, um, indicate whether he's had any other information. We have no regularly scheduled meeting to talk about issues. Um, and um, as I said earlier, I had hoped that um, after the um, our last meeting and your, um, uh, your presentation and your eloquence that the sheriff might have been a bit chastened. Um, call me naive, but um, that has not happened. And so um, at this point, um, particularly in light of what um, what he presented or lack thereof today and um, how hamstrung um, his, um, uh, his subordinates were who did come and attend the meeting, they could um, take back information. They had no independent ability to respond. Um, uh, and uh, it's, this is playing a game. And I don't see that we have 
much too much important work to do, and I don't see any point in sitting and waiting to see if um, he will change his mind because he has not. So I don't know if that answers your question, Commissioner Bonner, but that's um, that's where I stand at the moment, and I um, assume Commissioner Vera would agree with me. I do, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak before we decide how we're going to proceed on this? Oh, okay. Um, now, from a um, procedural standpoint, we have um, a uh, Commissioner Tolentino's amendment, which was seconded. We also have um, Commissioner Kennedy's um, amendment which was seconded although we don't have we certainly don't have language <coughs> as commissioner Janet indicated for um, a you know changing the resolution to resign so I'm quite sure how we proceed at this point i mean we can certainly vote on the two amendments but um if we were to um vote to um, um, ask the sheriff to resign, we certainly need language that doesn't currently exist. So, can I offer some language, uh, Madam Chair? Um, is that something that you can do um, fairly quickly, or do we yes. need more time? Okay, go ahead. So, take it, um, take it away, Priscilla. So, um, if, if, if folks are looking at the document, uh, the first uh, amendment would be that we would strike. Uh, uh, grave concerns regarding uh, and insert no confidence in. So it would read if adopted resolution expressing no confidence in Sheriff Alex Villanueva's leadership of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department um, and uh, and condemning we should maybe add there and condemning his failure to cooperate with civilian oversight. So that would be um, the amendment to the title of the resolution. Um, and then uh, the other amendments would be to the uh, therefore be it resolved clauses on page four. Uh, I would suggest that on the first therefore be it resolved, uh, we add a sentence that says um, based on the aforementioned comma, the commission has lost confidence in the sheriff's ability to effectively govern the department, period. Then on the last, uh, uh, be it resolved, um, we would strike um, uh, the, the clause of the sentence that starts with the commission will use all the tools provided by the board, etc. cetera. I, we would strike the remainder of that through accountable and in its place, write, comma, he should step down. So that sentence would read, be it further resolved, should the should Sheriff Villanueva continue to facilitate dysfunction in the Sheriff's Department and fail to participate in the meaningful oversight, uh, in, meaningful, in, the meaning, in the meaningful oversight efforts of his agency, uh, comma, he should step down. This is Commissioner Tolentino. I would accept that language as amended. And um, are you, um, Commissioner Tolentino, making any motion regarding your proposed amendment that was um, that was seconded? If the end result is no resignation, I think this language uh, covers it, and I I accept the amendment by Commissioner Osen. I mean you accept the language um yes. of, okay that she proposed okay anybody else have any yes uh commissioner Vera. i i do and and again not, not to quibble but I, i'm trying to uh i was trying to listen to commissioner Nelson's um last statement uh, wouldn't it be more appropriate to change the word if to because so in other words because he has failed uh to um cooperate with oversight, he should resign, as opposed to if. Uh, it shouldn't be a conditional. I think what we've heard today is that um, we've reached the end of the road and we're, we're calling for that. So 
I wouldn't include a conditional that that lays out another future road. If if more violations occur, it should be because. Um, exactly. Where where are you? Where are you in the referring to it? Are you talking about the last be it resolved? Yes. Okay. So um, so then it should so then it would say uh, Sheriff Villanueva. Um, Oh, I continues to so so what we could do. Is there any chance staff could could make these changes and then put it up on the screen so we all could see it? Oh, you mean? Yeah, I mean we're they got a word processor and if they could they pull it up, make this proposed changes by Priscilla and then put it up on the screen on the shared screen we could all see what we're voting on. Um. Mr. Williams, is that possible? Yeah, give us give us one second. We'll see if we can do that. So I see that Eric uh, Montalban Lara is on. Eric, do you happen to have that document pulled up on your screen? No, but I can I can get it. Okay. Because I believe you would have the most recent version of that. Um, so I will allow you to be presenter and walk you through opening it up on the WebEx. Oh, oh you know. Um, I have to I have to log on to the to my desktop from work, which is going to knock me off of this connection. So, in order for me to access that document, unless um someone can email the final Word document version to me to Jennifer, I will pull it up on my screen. Uh, I believe Eric has that final version. Okay. Um, just to to get to the point that Hernan was making, perhaps what we could do. Uh, is strike the last, therefore, uh, the last be it resolved clause. Um, and then uh, add um, at the end of the first be it resolved, uh, he should resign. So it would say, um, based on the aforementioned, the commission has lost confidence in the sheriff's ability to effectively govern the department. He should resign, period. Period. He should resign. I would support that. Yeah. Sounds good. And then we would leave the other, be it for the resolve that we're still interested in having a productive relationship, if possible. Yes. Okay, thank you. And Chair Rubin, it doesn't seem like it will be a quick thing for me to pull that up on my screen. I don't know if the commission is in agreement based on what they've heard or if they need to see it in writing, but it would take a little bit for me to get it on the screen and make those changes that were noted. Yeah, and I think considering the hour and the fact that we do have general public comment, I don't see that we're in a place that that we can take the, unfortunately take the time to do that so i don't know that, madam chair perhaps while we're doing general public comment we'll we'll uh edit the document and then once general comment is over we'll, we'll push it out to the commissioner I, excuse me but i think the document is from a working point of view i think we're we're uh, and so I think we can go. Yes, I, you know what? Um, thank I disagree. You. I, so agree. I disagree. I, I disagree. I would like to see it in writing before I vote on it. I think Brian's suggestion was excellent. Let's take the public comment. We can get it up and have a look at it. All right, with that, um, um, uh, Jennifer, how many people do we have signed up for general public comment? Um, so again, I don't think that I have accurate data because the reports that are being pulled are not showing me good numbers, but I would guess around five. Um, but what has happened in the previous ones is it will inform me that they've signed up, even though I am not seeing their name. So I don't have an accurate count for you. All right. I suggest we um, make use of the time while there's an attempt to pull up the document and um, 
that um, we take general public comment again, one minute each. Got it. And for, for all of the attendees who would like to provide general public comment, um, as a reminder, if you could raise your hand in the participant window or send a chat to the host, we will be sure to call on you. And first, a comment, uh, an announcement in Spanish. Buenas tardes. Si necesita traducción en español, por favor, diga la palabra español antes de comenzar sus comentarios y alguien traducirá sus comentarios cuando termine. Thank you. The first comment will come from Joseph Mazlich. Please go ahead with your comment, Joseph. Oh, it looks like. Um, no, no, I'm here. Oh, yes, please go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, yeah just a, a short comment on what you're currently working on. It seems a little out of tune if I'm uh, if I'm remembering the original to both ask for negotiations with somebody and ask them to resign. And unless you're posing that as a kind of alternative, that either let's start talking now about this, or we'd like to see you resign. Uh, as I said before, I don't think there's much value in asking somebody to resign. You just start the wheels turning, whether it's through recall or through the other uh, mechanisms uh, uh, that uh, were described. Uh, but uh, to have to have them both ask for discussion and for resignation uh, seems a little strange. Um, but perhaps if you're determined to ask for resignation, then have it as a, having it as an alternative, uh, because I think it does close the door. And uh, what's it like? You're closing the door, but asking to talk. Anyway, thank you and uh, good wishes with making progress with this, no matter how things turn out today. Okay, thank you. And the next public comment will come from Alex Cave. Please go ahead with your comment, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, I definitely appreciate Commissioner Harris's and the previous gentleman's concern about how um, it seems like calling for his resignation is basically saying, like, we're not going to work with you. But as we've mentioned in this meeting, he he is not going to work with you. I mean, he's he's shown that he is obstinate. He's not showing up to these meetings. And as members of the public, we trust you all to make these decisions for us. We put our faith in you that you will execute things that are important at that you will take uh, take pride in your in this job that you have, and you will stand up for us. So basically, if you if you decide not to to call for his um, him to step down, it's basically saying that that you're you're like going to let this happen. It's almost like you're in an, almost an endorsement of his behavior. So you know, I know I can understand completely why why you know the fears of that. But basically, we need you to do this for us as a community. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Jacqueline Venters. Please go ahead with your comment, Jacqueline. Uh, it appears I'm having a difficult time on muting Jacqueline. Uh, Gina Viola, please go ahead with your comment. Would... Chair Villanueva is the one who has closed the door when he defied the subpoena issued by this oversight commission. There are no hopes at further negotiation. negotiations. He's shown you this over and over again. COVID was running rampant in the jails. We were provided false information that he didn't even provide you with. And nor was there ever any clarity in and around that. 10 people have been killed by the LA sheriffs since George Floyd's death. I applaud you all for your bravery and for asking for the sheriff to step down and asking the Board of Supervisors to do what they need to do to get the state attorney general to take care of this. We don't have time for a recall. How many more families need to lose loved ones? Thank you. Thank you. And Jacqueline, please go ahead with your comment. Yes, I want to know what plan for um, all Jacqueline, if you're still speaking, we cannot hear you. Can you move closer to the microphone? I'm sorry, Jacqueline, it appears that we're still having issues hearing you. Um, so we will go ahead and move on to the next person. Well, okay. So 
not quite hearing her. Um, while we do that, I'm going to move on to the next speaker for public comment. If you believe that you have signed up for public comment and you have not called on yet, please lower your hand and then raise it again to get yourself back into the queue for this item. Send a message to the host. The next comment will come from Mark Anthony Johnson. Please go ahead with your comment. I must say that I appreciate the level of conversation and debate we're having uh, on this commission meeting. Uh, I think it's really critical uh, that we explore all the options that you all are doing right now. Um, this is bigger than the sheriff. And as folks said, he has rejected you all uh, time and time again. And I think uh, to respond to Commissioner Harris, certainly the door is closed. Uh, but we need to send a message, not just to Sheriff Villanueva, but to anyone that is in the sheriff's department, that there is an ecosystem of accountability that includes the commission, but includes the community, it includes the ballot box, it includes the attorney general, it includes so many other mechanisms that they and the sheriff are not immune to. And your statement today contributes to that. And so I think it's very critical, it's really important that you all hold the line and continue to push forward. And I thank you for that conversation. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Julie Martinez. Please go ahead with your comment, Julie. Please consider utilizing the office of the California Attorney General. Dylan Weva has made disparaging comments against both you and the County Board of Supervisors. I have heard him in interviews, town halls, and both public and mainstream radio criticize the COC. The pub stands that Villanueva is openly defying to, to work with you. Please use the power in Beth you to protect our community. We are counting on you. We are relying on you. Lives are literally in the balance. Please be brave. Please demand that he, Villanueva, step down. Thank you. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Michelle Infante. Please go ahead with your comment, Michelle. Uh, you need to throw away your practical your logic. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but your boyfriend, Sheriff Alex Villanueva, is not coming back. He has absolutely no intent to come. He manipulated the COC to allow them to come in and make a statement, posture themselves, blow up their chest, make a statement. And then when it came time to take a question, they deflated and took a bunch of steps back. And now they don't want to face uh, the community. Um, ask for what you need. Uh, he thinks you're a joke. I mean, you've been up here for three years. And how long has it been to come up here and not, not answered questions, not participated in meetings? No, you need to listen to the community. They come up to you year after year, month after month, bringing you all the trauma and all the different things that are going on within the community. And you allow him to get away with this. And Thank you. You belong in this leadership. Thank you. And that does conclude your time. The next comment will come from Andres Kwan. Please go ahead with your Andres. I just have to say that the door is closed. Is shut closed, is locked. Uh, in fact, there's no door at all. Uh, Villanueva has built a wall instead of a door. Uh, so much so that the ACLU, the LA Times, families have sued him time after time. The county has sued him time after time. You've sued him. What door are you talking about? With all due respect, Commissioners Giggins and Harris, it smacks a bit of short term amnesia that you're saying there's still some door that's open, some ulterior reality that you're living in. How long will you be played for and dragged along? And lastly, Commissioner Harris, I have to say your remarks on this issue to the families and to the public have been so condescending and deeply offensive and wrong. You're just wrong. Have you read the news, the LA Times opinion today? I suggest you read up because a recall is not the only way to remove Villanueva. There's also a grand jury accusation, but more importantly, we could grant in the county charter the power of the board to impeach and remove the sheriff for specific grounds of violating the public trust. And not just the sheriff, the sheriff, but any sheriff coming after him. Thank you. And the next comment will come M.W. Please go ahead with your comment, M.W. 
Yes, I advocated and organized for your subpoena power. The passing of your day, I have advocated and organized to the governor for his signature of AB 1185. And I disagree with former Lieutenant Sheriff Harris Giggins. There is absolutely no door to open. And it's plain that Commissioner Harris does not even understand exactly how this sheriff can indeed get It is the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department that has moved all doors to transparency and obstructing justice. I agree with Commissioner Bonner, the Nueva burned the bridges. Burned with legal activity beyond the point of simply grievances announcing actions. It is time to remove him. Vote today, finish this resolution. Don't close this meeting until it's sent. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Nicole Batalagia. Please go ahead with your comment, Nicole. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead, Nicole. Sheriff Villanueva would rather you not exist, the Board of Supervisors not exist, the Inspector General not exist, protesters not exist, and journalists not exist. He doesn't care about us and he's killing us. It's not grave concern that I feel, Commissioner Harris, but grave fear. We are counting on you with our civilian voices to call for his resignation, which is the very least you could do. Thank you. And the next comment will come from Andrew Lewis. Please go ahead with your comment, Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead, Andrew. Great, thank you. Um, I, I'd just like to say that uh, it's it's becoming uh, widely accepted almost on a nonpartisan basis across LA County and California and almost nationally that Sheriff Villanueva is, is the most ineffective uh, illegitimate uh, elective official that we have. Um, anyone that is not calling for his resignation at this point is denying that he is committing human rights violations and um, has blood on his hands and basically authorizing the um, deadly use of force against our constituents every single day. If this commission isn't willing to step up and acknowledge that, I don't really know what you're doing and I hope that you would resign um, your, your interests are supposed to serve the people um, of this city, and if you're not willing to do that, I would just hope that you would step aside and let a commissioner step up that's willing to do the job um, of the Oversight Commission, which I see a lot of you are not willing to do for whatever political reason. So please step up, do the job, or resign. Thank you. And the last public comment will come from Joseph Gomez. Please go ahead and comment, Joseph. Hello, um, so I just want to shine a light on what the member of the ACLU that was here with us today said about um, Commissioner Harris making rude or um, dismembering comments to the families. I do not believe uh, Commissioner Harris made any rude and or dismembering comments to any of these families at all. I don't know what you're talking about. And to the last person who just spoke, it seems like you're going on a rampage asking everybody to resign. Stop yourself while you're ahead. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. And we do do you have two additional individuals who signed up? Pastor Q, please go ahead with your comment. Yes, um, I would like to say that the sheriff is a person with authority and the power to enforce the law, and yet he defies authority. What kind of message is he sending? He defied authority when he first took office by reinstating Mendoyan. Uh, he did that unilaterally because he thinks he can do whatever he wants to do. A young man was killed and we're finding out it's possibly because of deputy gang initiation. In, the, in, the, in this criminal and racial justice environment, we need to send a message that we are serious about law enforcement accountability. We cannot have this any longer. We started in 1967, always calling for the training then we had the McCone con Commission after every uprising. We called for training. Listen, some folks cannot be trained and some doors are closed. And when some doors are closed, there's a window that's open. And uh, Villanueva doesn't even give us a window to walk in. So we need to call for his resignation and we need to do it right now. 
Thank, Thank you. you. And the last public comment will come from Mary Rachel Gardner. Please go ahead with your comment. Yes, I would like to piggyback off of the last uh, public comment. Uh, I again was the one announced earlier. I, I was a victim of a, a hate crime starting this summer, and it's been really unnerving to find out about everything going on in LA, all the crime, the increase, all under Villanueva's reign. And I even read about articles that the FBI got involved with this subgroup stuff. Like, again, my home was broken into. I lost things. I didn't realize what was going on. I've been sitting in on every single meeting since July. And I don't see him taking any action to take you guys seriously and non-compliant. He's, again, I'll say it again, pompous. I'm, I'm disgusted by that letter. It was also an e-signature. I don't even think he's writing this. He's got a staff that's probably putting that all together. I don't see the genuine humility and empathy from Villanueva. And he's supposed to be representing, protecting the people. I don't see this. I, I'm scared. Again, I've been living in East LA for a year. I see a lot of potential here, but it, it, we can't with him still in power. Thank you. And that does conclude public comment um, for general public comment. And I do have the document ready, Chair Rubin. So if you would like, I can pull that up on my screen um, yes. and go through with Commissioner Ochen to make sure that everything's correct on that. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, yes, Commissioner Ochen, we do hear you. Um, and I have this on my screen. You may not have everything that you have said at this point. If you could just walk me through that, I'll make the updates right now on my screen. Sure, so uh, the, the cited portion is correct, and it should say, con and condemning is failure to cooperate with civilian oversight. So it would read, resolution expressing no confidence in Sheriff, Sheriff Alex Villanueva's leadership of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and condemning his failure to cooperate with civilian oversight. If we scroll down to page four, so that's correct. Uh, scroll down to page four. Oh, um, yeah, no, so that's not in the right place. It should be the last sentence. The last sentence of the first be it resolved. So go back up. So after no, after um, after via Nueva and the first be it resolved. Yeah, and then we want to capitalize B. And then um, this this next be it resolved. We should write a nevertheless after comma nevertheless, and then we'll change the formatting. We should say nevertheless comma the commission, and then scroll down. Then the last be it resolved will be uh, deleted. Completely. Completely. That's it. If I might add, why don't we add the word immediately after he should step down? Mm. I have no objection. Yeah. I'm sorry, where does it say he should step down? I think uh, I just deleted it. He should resign. Uh, JP is suggesting that we write, he should resign immediately. Right here is a new paragraph. No, 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 no. No, go back up to the, the highlight sentence. So then it should say the last sentence, the last sentence starting with he should resign. And then it should say he should resign immediately, period. And that includes all of the language comments that you had, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so Chair Rubin, I'll turn this back over to you if you have any other questions or updates before we do the roll call vote on the friendly amendment or the amendment. I think um, if you would um, move it back up and just scroll through it so we can look at it one more time. And the changes are highlighted in yellow. So would you like me to skip over the areas that are not in yellow? Yes, please. Okay. 
sorry, the scroll has only one speed. <laughs> okay. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, so based on the aforementioned, the commission has lost confidence in Sheriff Villanueva's ability to effectively govern the sheriff's. He should resign immediately is the change in yellow. And the last paragraph was deleted um, and that concludes all of the changes that were made. Stop right there. Um, I have to admit uh, the comments of Joe Maslin do sort of make sense. Where it's like we're asking him to resign, but yet we're still saying we want to work with you. It does seem a bit of a contradiction there. That's just me. If you're all confident or comfortable leaving it there, fine. But I think Mr. Maslin does make a, a valid uh, observation. I'm, I'm comfortable leaving it there. I think it does express. Um, you know, the idea that the sheriff, the ball's in his court, right? He's the one that closed the door and if he wants to reopen it, we remain willing to work with him. Yeah. Exactly. And um, so um, thank you for this, Jennifer. Um, and I'd like to call for the vote. Commissioner Bonner. And just to clarify, this is changes. Excuse me, my vote is aye. Okay, I couldn't hear if that was a yes or a no. It was so bad. Well, yeah. yeah, Chair Rubin, just to clarify, are we voting on this final resolution or are we voting to accept the changes of the resolution? Uh, no, we're voting on this as a final resolution. Okay, so let's start again. Um, Commissioner Bonner. Yes, I vote aye. And I'm, voting, I'm voting in favor of the resolution as amended. Thank you. Commissioner Giggins. I have a. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I have a, uh, a point to make. I just want to say. I want to commend the commission for looking at all the angles and all the ingredients. This is what the committee did. And this, this is what we just uh, did again as a group. And also, um, so what I'm going to do, and I want to do it in honor of Mr. Q. I vote yes. Commissioner Harris. Let my verbal vote of yes. In oral representation of John Hancock's signature Declaration of Independence, I vote yes. Commissioner Kennedy? Yes. Commissioner Ochin? Yes. Chair Rubin? Yes. Commissioner Thompson is absent. Commissioner Tolentino? Yes. And Chair, Vice Chair Vera. Yes. Thank you, Motion Well, that, um, that is, is carried. Um, I think um, since we have already had um, um, general public comment and considering the hour, it's now one thirty-five. Um, I'd like to forego the um, uh, agenda item number three of the commission updates and um, call this meeting to an adjournment. Second. All right. See you all next month. All thank right. you all for your. Um, thank you. Thank you all for your hard work and um, the process that everybody has gone through. Um, and I um, really believe, had it not been for the um, the ad hoc committee on the resolution, that it we wouldn't have gotten to this point. So um, I want to recognize uh, once again all of your hard work and how important it has been. So thank you all very much. Stay well and. Um,
I'm sorry. Oh, I, just have, I just have one additional question. I know that there was a motion to subpoena um, Sheriff Alex Villanueva that I don't believe we made any kind of a vote on yet. So I'm not sure if that is still um, in consideration or will be tabled. Well, um, I would I would propose that um, uh, considering first of all this, the passage of this resolution, but that um, we um, we establish a procedure where requests for subpoenas would go to the ad hoc committee. So I would um, refer the request for a subpoena to the ad hoc committee, and they can. Um, evaluate the um, the validity of the request for a subpoena at this point in time. Thank you all very much, and stay well and go vote. Thanks. Thanks. Thank bye you. Bye. Oh. Call me. I will. <laughs>